Tony, we are ready. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. We'll uh, start with a roll call. All right. Uh, Chell Anderson. Present. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Bayreuther. Here. Micah Chappelle. Tony Doan. Here. Damon Doyle. Here. Al French. Robert Hamlin. Uh, Robert Hamlin is uh, not longer a council member. He 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 is no longer eligible. So he, that's why he's not here, and we don't have his replacement yet. Roger Hiringa. Here. Here. Matthew Hepner. Craig Holt. Craig uh, will be late. He will join us uh, about noon. Peter Ricci. Here. Katie Sheehan. Here. Caroline Traub. Uh, Caroline, her term expired, and as far as I know, she didn't uh, reapply for another term. And we don't have her replacement yet. Corey Wilker. Here. Representative Larry Hoff. Lauren Lathrop. Lauren also won't be here. He is busy with the uh, legislation. Senator John Lovick. Representative Alex Rommel. Senator Linda Wilson. I am here. And you mentioned Larry Hoff. Larry Hoff is no longer a legislator. So there will be a replacement for him. But so he's not on this council any longer. And, and uh, dear Mayor Bechtal. I'm here, uh, Dustin. Thanks. And Micah should be. And Micah should be. Uh, recall some people I didn't catch. Uh, Micah Chappelle. I am here. Al French. Matthew Hepner. Craig Holt is late, and that should round us up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Trail, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question with, with Caroline. She didn't apply for reappointment. Um, I guess I just have a question about people who were appointed and they haven't found a replacement yet. Are they still eligible to be part of the council and vote and all that? Or is it if you, you know, once your term is up January 2023, you are off the council, have no, no vote? Um, and no standing. I, I don't know the answer to that question. And um, there might be other people in that position. The council members that uh, with expired term, uh, they can continue uh, joining the meetings and, and uh, have a vote. But uh, uh, Dirk is here, so he's more knowledgeable than me on that. Well, I don't want to pretend to be more knowledgeable uh, still in on that. I know that the past practice has been that members whose terms have expired um, because of the governor's policy of, um, of limiting terms uh, is um, they've continued on until a replacement in some instances. I know that was uh, extremely unhelpful, but uh, that's uh, that's the best I can do for now is to echo you, Stoyan. <clears throat> Okay, and Corey. Thank you. Um, that was my question, particularly. I did uh, reapply, but I haven't received confirmation. So, should I abstain from from any voting, or uh, I can? I, I'm asking that question directly. If I should just abstain, if there is perhaps uh, impropriety by not having um, been reappointed to this term. And my question is exactly the same as Corey's. 
based on the practice in the past, uh, you again you join the meeting, you 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 can vote, you have all privileges as uh, uh, any other council members until you are uh, if you are replaced. But you can continue uh, uh, attending the meetings and be uh, active council member with all privileges. Micah, go ahead. I was just going to say, yes, you can continue and you're allowed to vote per RCW 19.27.070. Uh, it says that's your terms or until replaced. So um, that should provide the answer to that RCW. Thank you, Micah. Appreciate Thank that. you, Micah. Okay. Um, oh, you... by the way, uh, thank you, Micah. You're a step ahead of me. I appreciate that. I, I've I've confirmed that that's what the statute says. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, okay, let's. Uh, is anyone from the public uh, would like to be recognized? And we've got a couple or a few hands up in the uh, attendees list. And Dustin, are you um, able to take care of that and allow them to speak? I've got them all set up to be able to unmute as you call them. Excellent. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, Ken Burlett, Seattle Fire Department. I'll be talking about uh, if I could see it on the screen because you still have it very small. <laughs> um, item seven. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. Uh, Andrea Smith, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Andrea Smith, Building Industry Association of Washington. Okay. Thank you. And Larry Andrews. Larry Andrews, Andrews Mechanical. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, move on to agenda item number two, which is review and approve agenda. Move approval of the agenda as distributed. Thank you. Uh, second. Thank you, Chell. I think that was Chell. And, and Corey. And Corey. Perfect. We have a we have two seconds. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Okay, agenda item number three, review and approve minutes. We have ones from 11-4 and 11-18. So hopefully you had a chance to look at these. Um, I'm hoping to get these approved in one motion unless we have uh, any discussion on those. This is Corey, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from 11-4 and 11-18. Okay. I'll second that. Excellent, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. All right, now we'll move to agenda item number four, which is public comment on items not on the agenda. So at this time, we will take public comment from uh, for items that are not listed on the agenda. Go ahead and raise your hand if you do have something. Okay, Ken Burlett. Um, I guess it's kind of a question for Stoyan. Stoyan, I had submitted something um, regarding some correlation between the IRC and IFC and didn't know if that was missed on the agenda. No, it's not missed on the agenda. It's part of agenda item seven. It's posted on the website, uh, so... Okay, just to, because of the description of item seven doesn't and show that, so I don't know if the agenda needs to get modified to. No, it's part of your request. So you're requesting changes to IFC, and you're asking for a correlation with the International Residential Code. So okay, that's based fine. On the conversation I had with you, you said it's a correlation. It's not any new requirement added to the Residential Code. So it's it's the same agenda. Item. It's part of the same agenda. All right. Well, we'll discuss, I guess, at that point. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ken. 
Any other public comment? Okay. Uh, with that, we'll go to agenda item number five, which is council leadership. And Stoyan, if you want to go ahead and go over that. <laughs> You know, can you open the bylaws? Yes. So the council leadership, uh, we need, well, we need, the council needs to pick uh, a chair. Tony stepped in when our previous chair wasn't pre appointed. So he is eligible for another term. Uh, and uh, every, uh, anybody else who wants to be a council chair uh, is also eligible, uh, except the ex officials. Uh, anybody can make a uh, uh, um, nomination, including the ex officio. So, uh, and you see the bylaws uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, yes. Yeah. Tony, would you be open to being nominated uh, to continue as, as council chair? Uh, yeah, if the council sees fit that I did a decent job and didn't butcher things. It's true. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll put forward the nomination for, for Tony to uh, continue as chair. I thought you did a superb job uh, with, with difficult and uh, difficult issues to, to wrestle with. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, this, oh, this go is ahead. David Doyle. I'll second that. <laughs> Excellent. Sounds like a unanimous vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Any against? Okay. Motion carries. All right. So the okay. second one is the vice chair. Vice. Uh, the council needs to vote on the vice chair as well. The same. The same comment uh, for uh, Damon. He was. Uh, uh, appointed when Tony uh, became a, a chair, so he is also eligible uh, for another term. Okay. Corey, go ahead. David, would you be open to that role again? Uh, that all depends on Tony's attendance throughout the year. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Yes, of course. Well, <laughs> <laughs> then I put forth the motion for David Doyle to be vice chair of the council. All right. And I'll second that. Okay. nomination if it needs a second excellent so we have a nomination and a second uh any discussion okay all those in favor say aye aye, aye. any against okay motion carries okay uh let's go to uh agenda item uh six appointment of committees they one of these documents are you want to call EBS SBCC 2024 BS. That's right. Okay, so I will start with the technical advisory group. So in the technical advisory groups, we currently currently have a council mem uh, council member as the chair, and we also have uh, council members that are appointed. To serve in the technical advisory group. So I have a question for the council. Uh, under the agenda item that I'll be asking for a work group to work on the bylaws and policies and procedures, I have some uh, proposals for modifications to the rules related to the technical advisory groups. We have two options. So we can go through all these technical advisory groups and uh, uh, modify the membership. Or if you want, we can wait. I can uh, uh, share with you and the work group that I will be asking for what my ideas are. And after the uh, council votes on the seats and the number of technical advisory groups, then we can go back and uh, work on the membership. Sounds good. Is there any discussion on that? Go ahead, Micah. So, Story, can can you or or Derek give us a process update on up on modifying the bylaws? I thought there had to be uh, something posted, and there has to allow public comment for those changes and all those kind of things. So, so, 
I'm not saying we'll be modifying the bylaws now. I'm saying that uh, I'll, I will ask the council to establish a small work group that will work on potential changes. So we are not even close to proposing anything officially. Okay, thank so, you. So, sorry if I wasn't clear, but it's not, the idea is not to make any changes to the bylaws right Okay, uh, just uh, thanks for the clarification. It sounded like you wanted to propose something before we move forward on tag. No, sorry, I, I wasn't clear. No. Oh, so, okay, thank you. <laughs> Jay, go ahead. And just given the uh, agenda that we've approved, it looks like committees is up now and discussion of the tag and the bylaws laws is later. And I would encourage us to stick to that because we have some other uh, more pressing business, and I think the tag and bylaws discussion may be wide open, more wide open. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jay. Agreed. Oh, okay, so uh, uh, just so you can scroll down until we get to the committees. Okay. Do so. Currently, we have Corey is the chair. Uh, you see the council members that are members of this committee, and we have uh, Robert Hamlin, who is no longer a council member. Uh, so we have one seat for a volunteer if, if there is a council member who wants to serve on this committee. Okay, any uh, volunteers for the Building Fire and Plumbing Codes Committee, since Robert is not. Go ahead, Todd. Well, I was just going to raise the point here that this is the challenge, though, right? If we don't know who could be the tag chairs, then someone might be interested or willing on the committee as at large, right? That's also true, yes. Okay, Corey, go ahead. I was wondering, we have a number of members on there. Do, do all positions have to be filled in order to hold the building fire? What's the minimum amount of um, participation? No, there is not a magic number here. Well, there is one. We cannot exceed seven. So we could still, if we needed to, have a building fire and plumbing codes committee meeting uh, and appoint a new member later if somebody wanted to join? We can do that, yes. Plus, we will also have some new, new council, council members. members, yes. Right. So we get an opportunity if they want to get involved. So, yes. so we don't have to do anything for this position now. That's correct. And the same comment applies for the rest of the uh, standing committees. So if the council wish to postpone this, then uh, it's a good option. We can do it at the next meeting. And Corey, you're willing to stay on as chair of the Building Fire and Plumbing Codes Committee? Certainly, if if the council wants me to do it, I would certainly uh, do whatever I can do to help. Thank you, Corey. Micah, go ahead. So it, it almost sounds like this item needs to be moved down in the agenda to correlate with the tag discussion since the committees are made up of tag chairs and we need to vote on that later down the item. So I'm going to move to table this item and discuss it with item 11 on the agenda. If I can clarify one more time. So the item on the agenda, we are not picking any technical advisor group members. All I will ask for is uh, volunteers, council members, volunteers to help me craft the language that we can propose uh, uh, modifications to the bylaws and the policies and procedures. You can you can table this agenda item until the next meeting uh, in March. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry, starting. I'm I'm reading the agenda and it says tag composition and tag member appointments as a council action today. Is that not what is occurring in item 11? No. Uh, uh, can you go to item there? Okay. Establishing the following work groups. Okay, it's a work group that will be working on this, not choosing the technical advisor. So okay. we will be Sorry, that is... 11, we will be establishing work groups that will be working on this. Okay, just quickly. Okay. We are not establishing tags. 
we are a little premature on the committees because we don't know who our new council members are going to be. So that would be best to probably delay to not even this meeting because we don't know who our new new council members are going to be. And the item number 11 is to establish work groups, not to compose a member appointment. That's great. Yes. Fair okay. then, then I will move to table this item until the next meeting or an appropriate meeting thereafter. Okay. This is Corey, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second discussion. Um, I don't know if Damon or Jay want to speak to that specifically. Go ahead, Damon. Yeah, I just want to point out that uh, we have our next council meeting is on the 17th of March, and we do have both an MVE and a BFP committee scheduled for the 10th. <clears throat> Would those meetings then be postponed? We are required to file the meetings, the schedule with the controversies office. However, uh, uh, the practice is if we don't have anything for these meetings, we uh, uh, cancel the meeting. Uh, Jay, go ahead. And I'm wondering if we could exclude or separately appoint the legislative committee. It meets weekly during session, and I think it's going to be important to continue that work. Go ahead, Todd. Did you have something? Uh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Stoyan, do you want to speak to that? Uh, well, it's up to the council. Uh, let me, can, can you go, can you go, uh, this thing, can you go to the ledge committee and at the bottom of that? Yes. Yeah, so I'd just like to exclude the, the ledge committee from the motion to table or either take it up as a separate motion, whatever's easier. It seems that the ledge committee is full. We have seven council members and a representative from Mel who is a council ex official member, and we don't have available seats anyway. So the so tabling this as a whole would not affect the ledge committee. So the ledge committee can be approved. Understood. Okay, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, even if we voted on these things today, couldn't we reassess at the next meeting? If if there is no vote today, then the uh, standing committees will appear in with with the members currently in the standing. Oh, okay. So we would just maintain the membership from. Okay, that's that. That's fine. Yeah, I, I'm going to vote to table this thing. Uh, Roger, go ahead. Um, my question may have been answered. I um, just now. So the from what I've heard, the committees we could approve the legislative committee and the BFP committee as they stand today. Or, or are they, will they continue on unless we change them? I guess that's my question. It sounded like they will continue as they are right now until we change them. That's correct, Roger. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, any further discussion on the motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries very well. Okay, let's uh, move to agenda item number seven, which is request for emergency and off cycle rules. Dustin will uh, have the documents that Ken submitted. We had a brief discussion at the November meeting last year, and uh, the documents were posted on the website and the council members also get access to the documents. We have this web page uh, for the council members. If if, if you folks keep, still keep the uh, link, if you don't, we'll send it to you after this meeting just uh, to refresh it. But uh, I'm not gonna take a position on the off cycle rule this for the council members to decide. I, I uh, And I will talk about this uh, under agenda item 11, but what I wanna say is, from January 1st, 2021 until December uh, last year, we have 87 filings, which include 18 emergencies. And I don't know how many 20, 30 off cycles because each one of these emergencies most likely will require off cycle. So we are formally running a 
three year code adoption cycle, but at the same time, we keep filing new emergencies and new off cycle rules uh, every month. Uh, I don't see a benefit for that, but I will let the council members to uh, debate uh, Ken's proposals. I'm not technically knowledgeable on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Ken Brulet, you're the one who uh, brought this forward. Would you like to speak on this? Uh, yes, I would. Could you? So there's two different paths that I'm looking for. Is one is a simple. I I don't know what you're going to show here. What do you want me to show? Let's look. Try offset. Can. Let's look. Let's scroll down a little bit, please. Okay, stop right there. So let's start with this one right here. So the intention of the different proposals, and I'm hearing myself echo. Is there? I'm not hearing that, but can I mean, is it possible that everybody can mute if they're not talking? Thank you. Um, so there's two different uh, proposals, but it's generally the same goal here is this is about energy storage systems. And I brought this up at the last council meeting that uh, we had several people talk about trying to move forward the requirements that have been put together nationally, either through NFPA 855 or through the IFC 2024 co-development process. This first proposal here is probably the simplest without having to go through a line by line code change. And that is to change the section or I'm sorry, add the line that is shown here underlined under the scoping that includes NFP 855. NFP 855 is not referenced currently in the 2021 fire code or the 2018 fire code. And it's the nationally recognized standard that um, we are turning to, to make sure that we're not missing anything along with our adopted fire code. The fire code right now allows the fire code official to use reference documents, uh, but it's much easier if it's already in the scoping part of a section that it can be referenced. And then this, the second is that is just that referencing it in chapter 80, uh, which it is not now to use the most current edition, which is the 2023 edition. So that's the first proposal I'd like to um, talk about, which is the simplest versus going through and looking at amending chapter 12 with bringing forward all of the 2024 code changes that were already approved nationally and bringing them into the 21 code. So this is the first proposal that I think is the simplest that will help out industry and also us here in the state. Okay, thank you. Uh, any council discussion on this? Micah, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Ken, for submitting this. I do have a question on the language under scoping. It says that shall comply with this chapter as appropriate. Who deems what's appropriate in this chapter and how is appropriate enforced? We can strike that term if that's something that you would like to do. Um, if if that's the direction you want to go, I, well, again, well, I don't it, want to modify I, much I, on I, your proposal, but again, okay, maybe the word should be applicable. Because, maybe the word should be applicable because energy storage system um, is in section twelve oh six. So. It should be just maybe applicable. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion on this from council members? Sorry, I did have one more. Oh, um, I can see me, yeah. th that's okay. I I, I pause long, and, and you you're correct to assume it to move on. Um, Ken, the question would be, is the 23 version of the NFPA standard um, 
fully adopted through ICC and are we able to adopt that standard as you're referencing here? I know there's some legal procedures it, with that, whether or not we can adopt a reference standard before it's technically complete and adopted um, elsewhere. So that, that would be my question on that reference standard for the 2023. NFPA 855, the 2023 version has been published. The question is, has ICC referenced it in the 2024 code? That would be a re that would be part of the 2024 code. So yes, it would have been adopted through that process. Okay, uh, that would be my only legal concern is is whether or not we could adopt that reference standard for this. Other than that, and the the verbiage change to the scoping, I would be fine with this proposal. Thanks. Uh, Katie, go ahead. I guess I just wondered why it wasn't included in the at the very least the 2021 um code uh it, or if there was just a, does that make sense is that too simple of a question or no it, it's not too simple of a question at all that the issue is that this is such an emerging technology these energy storage systems that we're seeing throughout the united states that we've been playing catch up as quickly as possible. And you have to remember that the 21 code development process happened years before sure. 21. And so we're starting to see these submitted here in the city of Seattle and throughout um, the Western Washington area right now with, with no guidance, um, because again, the codes have not kept up with the technology. So NFPA 855 is one of the latest versions of a document that's available to help enforce the safety regulations. And, and that's why back at the, the last meeting, we had people from industry that were supporting uh, this recommendation to make this move is, is just because it's happening so quickly and we wouldn't be able to use this document until the 2024 code cycle is be seven, uh, several years away. So that's the reason we're, we're pushing it quickly and it, it wasn't brought up uh, during our initial 2021 code cycle process because we were unaware of how many of these systems were actually um, being submitted and um, wanting to be installed with without the necessary safety recommendations that are in this this document. Okay, Matthew, go ahead. Hi, uh, just some, some questions on the 1201.1 scope. So I'm imagining and thinking we're probably talking about battery packs for the most part um i'm picturing like the tesla wall mount type systems is that correct that is one version the tesla wall mount for the residential uses but yes so for the most part we were talking about battery technology or i guess this would also include some of the flywheel tech that's coming out yes okay so in regards to the batteries uh, a lot of the a lot of these are being used to put energy back onto the grid as well, and the energy that's actually in the batteries is going to be DC. So we will be transform the the transformation. We will be transforming that power from DC to AC as long you know if you're if it's being used in the house. Um, are we concerned about that where it says should shall not apply to equipment associated with transformation or transmission? I'm not looking at changing the scoping language. Okay. Uh, other than adding that line, so okay, you're, you're asking me about. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Regular by twelve oh six. Yeah, yes. that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead. Uh, we're seeing more of these being requested, and we're studying them on on multiple projects. So, from the architectural perspective. We're definitely seeing an uptick in this as people try to get away from from fossil fuels in um, in their buildings and try and uh, provide a bit more resilience as well. Um, I assume that we're going to look at both of these before we take action on on either of them. Is that is that correct? Yes, that that was my plan. After discussion, I was going to have Ken go into the okay. next one. That's correct. Thank you for clarifying for council. Okay. And Jay, go ahead. We can't hear you, Jay. I'm sorry. 
A process question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, given the backlog of uh, proposed off cycle rules that Stoyan mentioned, I just want to ask the question of if the council did not take action for um, Ken, Shell, Micah, people that are working on these projects, how are they handled today without cancel action? And what's the impact of us not taking action? Bill, do you want to speak to that? I want to put you on the spot, but Jay kind of halfway did, so I'll complete it. <laughs> did you say, Chell? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so at least, so I read the second one, um, and I, but I didn't read the actual 855 language. Um, the, the second one that, that Ken proposed and that puts restrictions on where these can be located and other things so if if and then also sizes and and um sizes not physical sizes but but battery or uh energy storage sizes um without that the the implication is that um when 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 we're designing buildings to accommodate these things we don't have the guidance or at least the requirements so these could, things could go in in many places that you know in three years when we adopt this they would not be allowed and that just means that when 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 firefighters or, or others come to a building they might not know where these energy storage systems are uh which i think is is challenging or they they might be oversized um again it's a rapidly evolving field but i think uh, Making sure that we have a guidance language is really important, so that so that building professionals and 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 firefighters know what they're going to deal with when they come to a, especially a new building that contains these things. Thank you. And uh, quickly, uh, Ken, go ahead. Well, I think Jay was maybe asking me also how how are, I think that his question was. Well, how are we going to handle this now, or how are we handling this now, and what would happen if this did not go through? So uh, this is a real life scenario is it's very difficult right now to identify when these projects are actually going in. And then once we have identified that the project is going in, and we, we also identify that the 2018 code is lacking, we then have to reach out to the applicant and make them aware of NFPA 855, and that is another uh, standard that's out there. And if they have designed their project to that, we then would have to use an alternate materials and methods to then allow it to be designed to NFPA 855 2023. The fire code official has the authority to use other recognized uh, national recognized standards, as I mentioned before. But when we put this right up front, into the scoping, it then allows any type of designer to realize that, hey, if I'm gonna have an energy storage system, the state of Washington says, I shall be using this chapter and NFPA 855. So everybody knows up front, and it's not something that's asked for after the project's already been designed. And the um, it just makes it much easier if everybody knows this information up front and not waiting till the very end after the permit has been applied for. Sorry, Jay, the, your audio cut out again. Thanks, Ken. That's very helpful and understanding it'd be a more streamlined process. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Um, Corey, did we get you covered? Yeah, it was more, I think, and I wanted just to ask, it's my understanding that some of those provisions are, it's about the inherent um, danger, life safety, explosions, how those systems are set up. So having the fire department there and making sure that those things are in place is why it's an emergency. Is that correct, Ken? To facilitate and make sure that they get built right and yes and, and it a lot also is with just the firefighter safety aspect of it sure. is that we need to know where these things are and then making sure that they're done with the the utmost um safety in mind with the 
proper uh, containment, extinguishment, and separation requirements. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, Ken, do you want to go to the uh, second proposal? Um, sure. This this is going to take some time, but I I would kind of like to ask council I what I tried to do in the second proposal after it gets brought up. I'll wait for it to get brought up. Is over on the right hand side. Um, I didn't try to reinvent anything. I just took the 2024 code language and showed it here in purple. Um, what they were looking at doing for the 2024 code and and you'll see um, a little bit of a difference here is you'll you'll see where the second sentence down under the scope it references it shows 1207. That's just a numbering thing that's different from the um, the 1206 that you saw saw before. And and again, that um, we just want to make sure we're we're referencing the correct code. So the previous one you looked at, I believe that emergency amendment was set up for the 2018 code and i just want to I, okay so I do you guys un understand that well yeah just for clarification for council uh we have two proposals you're you're asking for an either or and this would be no no i'm, I'm looking for you you have your emergency amendment to take care of the 2018. And then you have also the changes to the 2021 language, which you're seeing here. Understood. Continue. Okay. My apologies. Okay. Just so that's why there's different numbers. So I, I unless council wants me to go through each one and reach each comment, the comments, what the comments are is based on the code change proposals that were done for the 2024 international fire code that got approved all of the comments in there aren't for me it's from the information that was provided nationally for each one of these changes um, so i i think just not to waste your time and going through it i was just wondering if council had any questions since they had should have had plenty of time to review these documents if they had any questions on any of the proposed changes understood thank you chell go ahead yeah so the markup was done on which document and because i see r4 in here and r4 is something that we've been talking about as a council a lot uh, but i i want to make sure that if you did markup on a document that that is different than the washington document that it's reasonable to correlate the document you did the markup on to what we have in Washington, so we're not proposing so so that it's clear to council staff that if we approve this, it would be consistent with other things we've adopted in Washington. So I took the Does base, yeah, I, I took the base code of the 2021 IFC. I showed in green the current 2021 Washington State amendments. And then I showed in purple things that needed to be added to the 2021 Washington State Fire Code. And those in purple is the language that's, that's coming from the 2024 IFC. I'm trying to move it forward. Okay, so it's already correlated with what we've adopted in Washington in the 2021 codes. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I'm nodding okay. up and down and you can't see me, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's just what I wanted to, that, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, Chell. Corey, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so if, if I'm understanding this right, we have two proposals. One will cover us with some safety aspects of NFPA 855 until the 20, you're looking to fill the gap between now and when those codes become effective in July. That's the first one, yes. And then the second one is to cover us once we get into the next or into 21 code so that that's covered. That's why there's two proposals, one to fix the gap. Yes, you, you got it, Corey. <laughs> you Thank got you. it. Okay. Uh, with that, does council have, uh, is there any <clears throat> uh, need from council members um, or confusion on the documents that have been submitted that you would like 
to have specifically gone over. Chael, go ahead. Yeah, I guess um, if if a couple of small changes is adequate for covering the 2018 code, then are those you know small changes? Why are those change, small changes not then adequate for the 2021 code? I guess it, it's the level of urgency. I mean, I I didn't want to take. I didn't want to take all of the 2018 code and put all of this purple into it um, for a small amount of time. I thought since it was to try to use a term emergency that the best way to do that was to quickly reference 855 to clean up um, the 21 code. I thought would be just better to just show these changes in the 21 i don't know if i'm explaining this right or not but what i think what you i can help you out a little bit ken okay. i can help you out for that answer too okay um it is why it why it's a simple matter to do it that way chill is what they're doing for the 20 what ken is doing for the 2021 which is what's happening for the 2024 is they're bringing over that language from the nfpa document so you don't have to go search something specific elsewhere for something that can be included in the code, the IFC in, in one location. So instead of doing that for 2018, since it's just a stopgap measure, um, Ken is keeping it simple and just referencing you to that NFPA document right now. And then for the updated version, he, he's bringing that appropriate language from that document as they are going to do at the national level. Um, that way it's, it's more comprehensive and and keeps it all in one place so that's why kids doing it this way and I, I think it's a good process or path to it thanks thank you mike uh Chell, go ahead okay yeah and then i i just general a little bit of concern when we adopt a lot of you know strike throughs or, or additional language without a, a tag review or a, a more thorough review to make sure that this is you know, consistent and, and and all that so i guess i'm i think adopting a new reference is great and that's you know the 2018 code but adopting all these you know underlines and and new new things um because there are several or many um i guess i, I want to make sure we're getting it right and not not going to have to do it twice um, but I guess this one would be subject to public review if we adopt it today, right? Or if we move it, we would move it into a public comment period if we adopted it today. Is that correct? Go ahead. The request is for off cycle rule, which I, how my interpretation is the request is for off cycle rule, but we will run it through the process starting with the technical advisory groups and uh, uh, standing committees and the council and public hearings and this is uh, this is a longer process. Uh, if it's adopted as is, it wouldn't be off cycle rule. It would be uh, emergency rule. Sorry, say that last part again, Stoyan. I missed that. So if if you want to adopt it as is, you will vote. You will adopt it. Uh, but if if it's an off cycle rule, then we have to follow the requirements in the administrative procedures right, and the council bylaws. So we need to start from the beginning and uh, run this proposal through the technical advisory groups and the standing committees before we get to the public hearings and the final uh, council adoption. Understood. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. So we would run it through those those pieces. Okay, that's satisfying. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Thanks, I just wanted to talk a little more on this proposal with Ken and, and make some points on it. What Ken brought over, you know, you're talking about the process and getting it right. This, the, the changes he's showing here went through the national process, which is very robust. Um, and and this was, you know, a significant amount of time and stakeholder input on these proposals, especially with this specifically. And, and what Ken is doing here is just, you know, bringing that over in advance. Um, again, Ken mentioned that the code process at the national level is unfortunately behind technology in, in a lot of instances. And so that's why this is, is so far delayed 
and getting at the national level. However, the information is, is currently accurate and, and usable. And so I think this would be a, a good off cycle rule and um, as well as the other portion as the emergency rule, if that's what Ken is seeking, which is my understanding. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. I, I have a technical question for Michael or Ken, whoever can answer it. So uh, you're citing 2024. Is it finally approved? But uh, it's not, I think it's not finally approved yet. It's not published yet. So my concern here uh, is that you're saying it's approved. If something changes, then how how we how we can deal with that? Is it finally approved as is, as it is proposed, or potentially it may have other changes if it's not finalized by ICC yet? We don't have uh, the, I can we don't have the I can answer that for you. You're I'm correct. Right. It's not published. However, it is approved. The on the, the online governmental consensus voting occurred. Um, late last year for the approval so it went through the the committee action hearings at icc it went through the public comment hearings and it has gone through the online governmental consensus voting in other words the only folks that are legally able to vote on the code change proposals is, is through the the government associations so um and that has occurred and these have been approved as as ken has indicated here in the proposals i want to say that he has put some of the vote information in the comments when you see something like an AMPC, that means the proposal was approved as modified by public comment one. And so um, that's the information Ken has provided. So, so yes, that, that is done, Stoyan. Um, even though it's not published yet, there won't be changes to this unless someone came in with a lawsuit and tried to change it, but that has not occurred in the past. So <laughs> um, uh, according to all intent and purposes, the proposals are approved and uh, we'll be moving forward. Thank you. Okay, and Roger, did we get you covered? Yeah, my questions have been answered during the conversation here. Thank you, okay, excellent. All right, uh, so with that, uh, just for members of council and probably more myself than anyone. <laughs> so the, the request now is to, to go into emergency rule for the uh, 2018 for 12 chapter 12 and 80 and then um, off cycle for the 2021 can, can i verify that is ken's intent as well because the agenda kind of says you're going to do both of these as an emergency rule and both of them as an off cycle and, and yeah. i just want to make sure we're aligning with what ken is requesting and, and it kind of comes with the, the timing of this. I'm not too sure how long the off cycle would take if we were able to get it done prior to the 2021 IFC um, being enforced uh, because we'll have an issue if the 2021 comes on board and we haven't finished the review of the off cycle. So that's why if it was if it was allowed as an emergency now, and there is an expiration on that, I believe, it would expire. And then at that time, hopefully the off cycle would have taken place and then it would be formalized as an off cycle rulemaking. So it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't affect, I think anybody, if you make this proposal in front of you now, an emergency to the 2021, knowing that you're it's going to go through the off cycle process and that emergency rule is going to expire so that's my intention was to look at this as a, an emergency for the 2021 so it's in place just in case the off cycle ruling doesn't happen but you're and, it, and if somebody decides in the off cycle process that hey we're not we don't want to do this well fine the emergency will just fall off so i need to change my comment then because can I uh, the request was for off cycle rule so it is related to Chell's question I think his concern about can this be adopted as an emergency without any public involvement then the comment I made that the public will be involved but my impression was you were asking for off cycle rule so now it's 
you are correct that I was asking for off cycle rule, but in addition, that's why like on the agenda, Mike was saying, it, it kind of said emergency rule just because of that. So we'd have something in place July 1. Okay, Micah, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, that was my understanding. And so um, I, I, for me, I, I'm going to kind of throw a monkey wrench in it for Ken. I, I don't believe that the timing is appropriate to determine the modification of the 2021 as an emergency rule. Um, I think we have a little time to make that determination. In other words, I, I am for making an emergency rule for the 2018 and then we can evaluate and moving the other one into off cycle rulemaking um, and then evaluate whether or not it gets done in time because we can always vote on an emergency rule as a stop at, at, at a later meeting, maybe the March meeting or, or April sometime before the implementation date of the 2021. So um, with that, I would like to make a motion as such with a modification to the 2020 or excuse me to the 2018 emergency rule document. So if we could bring that back up um, where we were talking about the scoping modification. If we can make that bigger for folks, I think that uh, it would be appropriate to say that energy storage systems regulated by section 1206 shall comply with applicable sections of this chapter and NFPA 855, does that sound like that would work for your scoping modification, Ken? If it helps to get it through, yes. But again, this language was the exact language that was brought forward for the 24 with the exception of yeah. the 1207. So yeah, if it makes it clear for Washington State to make that change, that's fine with me. Okay. So I would like to propose uh, or make a motion that that modification be moved forward in this document as an emergency rule. Micah, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just put a pause on that quickly just to hear what Krista has to say, just in case there's a, a procedure. Okay. Sorry, right, I didn't out. see Krista's hand up. Yeah, that's great. I just wanted to clarify for the council that an emergency rule that's adopted to WAC 5154A would be applicable as long as they want it to be applicable. There is no cutoff for the 2018 versus the 2021. So if you vote to have an emergency rule that's applicable to the 2018 or the 2018 code, we currently don't have any amendments to this section. So this would be a new section. They can continue to renew that as long as we are pursuing a permanent rule. So there is no uh, difference between the 2021 and the 2018 in this instance. You can just keep renewing it until you have the code language developed that you want adopted in the 2021 code. So you don't have to stop one emergency rule and do another emergency rule for the 2021 unless you do not intend to go into permanent rulemaking, if that's clear. No, what time out? <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't want to do that. I, I, I'm a professional English speaker, so I will translate. So if, if we adopt uh, as an emergency, the addition of NFPA, 855 in 2018, it will be, it will stay for 120 days and then we can renew it until we complete the off cycle rule uh, that will be for 2021. What Krista is saying, there is no difference between 2018 and 2021. When it's adopted as an emergency, it will stay in WAC until it expires or we change it with uh, a permanent language. So in this case, if the council adopts this emergency rule in 2018, we will have the time to work on 2021 language without 
without uh, acting on another emergency rule. Did I did I get right? Okay. Sure. But I, I'm I'm going to say that I don't want that to occur, and I don't think Ken does either, because there's significantly more language in the 2021 base code for this section than there is in the 2018. Again, this is just a stopgap pointing at NFPA 855 for the 2018. So so I I still will stick with my motion and intent to start off cycle rulemaking, and then if we don't get that modified in time, to come back and support an emergency rule with the 2021 language as Ken has shown. Okay, uh, Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, but if I'm putting this all together, is it is there a difference in the base language between 2018 and 2021? Is, is it possible just to take the one action of bringing the language of the 2021 into the 18? I don't know that it matters or I have a strong opinion. I'm just curious. Yeah. I, I'm going to step in here. If the problem is, is if you take the same, if you have that emergency amendment follow through in the 21 code, the section 1206 is moved to 1207. So that you're going to cause confusion if all of a sudden the 2021 20, it's just, it's not going to read yeah. correctly. It's not Thanks 1207. Exactly. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, it, it okay. gets moved to 1207. And that's why the proposal looks different than the one in front of you right here. It shows 1207 as the 2018 to 1206. So I I understand what Chris was saying, but it, it's not going to function properly. Understood. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate the, the clarification. And Krista, thank you for bringing that to the table. Uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, so it seems like the, the proper thing to do is is for the it would be to move into emergency rule with this small amount of added language for 2018, and then move into permanent rule for that small amount of language in 2018. And that seems like that would be a decent decent path forward for the 2018 code. That am I understanding our options correctly? You said 2018 twice for permanent, but that's not. Well, I guess I'm, I'm. The intent is to go. Um, um, and help me if I'm wrong here. The intent is emergency rule for 18. That gets us to our July 1 date, even if we need to extend that possibly. And then the emergent, then for the 2021. We can, if we are not done with off cycle, then we could go into emergency rule at that point for the 2021 or go into it today and carry it forward if need be and go and once off cycle is done for 2021, then we have something that's consistent with the layout of the of the code that's going to go into place with the 1207 and all that. And, and Well, I guess I'm, I'm seeing it slightly different. I'm looking just at the 2018 right now. And thinking we still have projects that are under the 2012 codes and so if we don't enter into permanent rulemaking for the change to the 2018 then people five years from now that are still working on codes under the 2018 or still working under the 2018 code that will have expired well before then so I, I think that's what Krista was mentioning, correct? Was was it doesn't expire, Krista, for, for these rules for the IFC? No, an emergency rule will expire after 120 days. You can continue it until you adopt a permanent rule, but you can only continue it until you adopt the permanent rule. So Okay, that clarifies it. So good question, Chill. You're correct. It would need to go into emergency rule and permanent rulemaking or off-cycle rulemaking for 2018, and then we would also have to come back with possibly an emergency rule, if not just straight off-cycle rule for 2021. Yeah, so I guess that's, I'm wondering, uh, Micah, if that's, you want to revise your motion, and, and I think maybe we just cover 2018 for now, and then have a separate motion for the 2021 several minutes from now. Yeah, that was, yeah, I agree with that uh, intent as well. So yes, I would be happy to modify that motion to have this 2018 off cycle rule with the proposed verbiage modification and 
enter this 2018 into, I guess it's either permanent or off cycle rulemaking, but into a permanent rulemaking process as well. That way it does, as, as Shell mentioned, I was going to say the same thing, Shell. We have, yes, you're going to get new code July 1. However, there's a lot of projects that are going to still fall and be reviewed and everything for the next couple of years under the 2018 or, or even longer. So, agreed. Okay, we have a modified motion. Corey, go ahead. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion on the motion on the table? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. <clears throat> okay, with that, we'll move to our uh, 21. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, sorry. Sorry, that's my fault. I, I have too many buttons. Uh, so I will make a motion that we move into off-cycle rulemaking for the 2021 modification to this chapter as proposed by Ken. Ms. Corey, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any against? <clears throat> okay, motion carries. Okay, thank you, Ken, for your uh, input on the, that. I don't think we're done. Okay. Go ahead. So, so I think Storian mentioned that I had, or I had mentioned that I submitted something for R328 for the residential code. I don't know if you have that. Give us a few seconds. So this is the current 2021 International Residential Code. And I'm showing here strike throughs and underlines to correlate with the 2021 IFC proposal that you guys are going to be moving into off cycle rulemaking. So the intention here then based on what you just did was to, to do the same and move this into off cycle rulemaking for the 2021, because this is to correlate the residential code with the fire code. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because this has not been done at the state on multiple codes the correlation between the fire code, building code, residential code, mechanical code. And this is the right thing to do is to bring this forward so there is a correlation, so there's not confusion between the two state adopted codes. I think you can, Micah, go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to process that as a procedure question. Would, would this been a, could it have been part of the off cycle rule process with the other item? And if so, would we need to go back and reconsider that item and include this? And I apologize for not catching that earlier. My opinion is yes, you, you need to evaluate this individually. Uh, I don't know if it's a correlation of something else. I didn't have time to review it. Uh, the other thing important here is that uh, Washington State is one of not very many states that list the priority for, for the code. So the residential code is upper on the list for priority. The fire code is number, I don't know, six or what was it? So the, my, my, my point here is if we have conflicting requirements, uh, not the fire code will be the applicable code, but it will be the residential code. So this uh, will it's still part of the same old cycle uh, approach, but it's in a different core. Again, I don't know, I haven't compared side by side, so I don't know if it's a, a correlation or 
going further than that, so I can't speak on that. Okay. Um, anything further, Micah? I'll hold off. Let others speak, and, and maybe Ken needs to speak more to this, but yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. Joel, go ahead. So Ken, can you state again where the, the underlying language comes from? So again, if if you look at the purple language that was in the previous document for the IFC, that's going through the off cycle rule process, which again is 24 language brought forward. If we don't correlate that with the residential code, there's gonna be some confusion. So if we have our 2021 fire code and our 2021 residential code, when it applies to the properties that are underneath the residential code, there's going to be confusion. So this is just to take that language if, um, it's approved in one code and correlated with the other code. And this is not, and this has not been happening at our state level. Nobody's correlating the codes. And so I have to, to correlate it. It has to be shown in this separate proposal like this. So this would have to be the same as the fire code. It's an off cycle rulemaking that you just went forward with the fire code to correlate it with the residential code. Is this, so, so can I don't know. My specific question is, is this coming from the 2024 IRC or the IFC or, or what? Where's the language coming from? It, it's coming from the 2021 IFC. And I would so the, have, the, the honestly, I would, honestly, I would have to double check to see if the uh, 24 IFC, I'm sorry, the 24. IRC did correlate this or not. And that's part of us doing that during this off cycle rulemaking process is just to, to verify. It's to get this on the book so you guys actually will assign this to a tag to do the off cycle uh, rulemaking for the residential I, code. I, I think that's fine. I'm just wondering, did, did you write the underlying sections or did it come? No, from? I did not write these. Is it, no, I did not write these at all. This is all base code language from the 24 model code. Okay, cool. Thanks. That was my simple question that was more complex than yeah, it needed I, to be. My turn, go ahead. Sorry, I was shaking my head, Chell. I didn't want to just butt in. But yes, that, that's where the language came from, is the, the proposals at the national level. And there was some correlation done there. So hopefully this will not have to carry forward into our Washington 2024 other than just having this base code. So um, if, if there's no other discussion, I'd be open to make a motion. Oh, go ahead, Roger. I have a, a general question and Micah, maybe you can answer it. I am not um, an expert on the, the IRC and Ken mentions that there's not, that there are areas that the codes are not correlated. And I and the way I take that and I from our past discussions, I kind of wonder, believe that there are other things between the codes that are not correlated. So are we being asked to do a special um, off cycle code to correlate this part of the IRC where there are other parts of the IRC and the building code or whatever that are not correlated? Is it a bigger issue than just this one particular item? And if so, should we do a special <laughs> uh, rulemaking to take care of this one item to correlate the fire when there are a whole bunch of other items that are not correlated? So Micah, if you can, or somebody could address that, I'm, I'm curious. I, uh, I can give my answer, not sure others will have it too. Sorry, who am I speaking over? No, you're good, Mike. I was going to say, go ahead, Mike. I do have a comment on that when you're done, and then we'll go to Corey. Okay, sure. Um, I, Roger, overall, there are several areas of correlation that need to occur through all the codes, quite honestly, um, in, in specific areas. However, I know this one is is 
coming up as an inherent danger in an item that is not captured adequately, you know, in a timely manner. Again, you know, we're talking about, you know, advanced technologies that are moving much, much faster than the code process does. Uh, so I think that, yes, that needs to occur. The correlation needs to occur more thoroughly over the codes. Um, but I think these ones that come up as a, as a, you know, more of an imminent danger, if you want to go that route, um, they probably do need to be addressed this way, unfortunately. Uh, so take that as you will. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. And, and to Micah's point, I think this one is more timely with the correlation, Roger. Um, Ken and I, I mean, have had discussions for two years on correlation issues with, with codes. And so, you know, we're, we're, the council members are aware that there's, there are some things that just don't correlate properly, but I think the appropriate time to tackle that whole issue would be uh, through our next um, rulemaking, you know, on cycle <laughs> and going through those take processes and having, you know, some strong communication and back and forth with those takes, whether that's through committee or um, maybe members of building or fire jumping into those takes just to make sure that that happens. But there's a review process at the beginning of those takes that should be catching a lot of that. Um, and with the workloads, it's really tough. I mean, I, you know, it's that's not an easy ask, but, you know, uh, technically speaking, we should be doing that, you know, through that tag process. But this one is just a little more imminent, I would say. Tony, uh, do Garrett, you mind, go ahead. Yeah, do you mind if I jump in just real quick, uh, provide a little bit of context? Uh, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, uh, by the way, thanks for the opportunity to chat about this real quick. Uh, Stoya mentioned at the outset that the, the legislature has anticipated that there could be uh, conflicts or a lack of correlation between the respective codes and has ranked them in statute. And so, uh, and the specific statute for those of you who might want to do some homework on this is RCW 1927-031, uh, which provides that in the case of a conflict among the, the codes that the legislature has adopted, uh, that the first name code shall govern over those that follow. So the first one uh, is, as Tony indicated, the International Building Code, uh, and then it goes down the list. So, so that's so from a you know lawyer's perspective, the way that we would resolve any conflict between them would be to look at the order of precedence and statute, and then identify which one comes first. Thank you, Derek. I just want to mention real fast on this correlation issue, Roger, to add to it. I, I wanted to, I do want to point out Ken did a significant amount of proposals through the IFC this year just to do some correlation on that front. Um, but again, as Tony mentioned, it's a huge project that needs to occur. Um, and maybe that's something that needs to be looked at in our bylaws that that, story, that we'll be doing over the, in the future. Um, the national level actually has a code correlation committee that goes in and does some of this work. So maybe that's something that, you know, an additional, I know it's an additional committee of work for the SBCC, but but maybe that's something we need to look at as a as a body as a whole. So thanks. Thank you, Micah. Uh, ben, I saw your hand up. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I, my only comment is is what was spoken about the hierarchy. And, and that's just kind of been used as an excuse that one code outranks the other code. So maybe we don't need to correlate. I, I don't think that's what we're trying to present here. We're, the codes still need to be correlated. Um, it, it, that you can't use that as an excuse of why we're not correlating at the state level just because of a hierarchy. I just don't think that's um, correct. Sure, and from a user-friendly standpoint and practicality, I would agree. Corey, go ahead. I was just gonna mention to Roger as well, part of this, like the residential code outranks the plumbing code. So when things are put into those codes and not correlated, which there are a few things that have happened, um, but when we're dealing with fire and electricians, um, these things become life safety, not just for people, but for the people building or, or firefighters fighting. And so I think that's, we take these things on their press or their emergency portion of it, right? It's, it's if somebody has got a water line sized incorrectly or uh, something, it's not, it's not going to hurt anybody. It's just going to uh, be an issue that we want to resolve and correlate those things so that when they're building houses or when they're building buildings, the codes are applicable, but uh, enforcement of that and all that other stuff, mine are not a priority. And I think 
um, fire and electrical, particularly would be just for safety. Thank you, Court. Um, Ken, do you have anything further? I saw your hand up. No, I'm sorry. That was me just clicking too many buttons. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Micah, go ahead. You ready for that motion? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think that's where we left off was uh, we were putting a, a, a hold on that. But I would like to make a motion that we enter this proposal into off-cycle rulemaking to correlate with the actions previously taken by the council. Is Corey all second? Okay, we have a uh, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Micah, go and ahead. I want to. I want to apologize to Stoyan and staff for all the off-cycle rules. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you realize that, but you require us to develop instant pages by April, adopt R4 without details by April. Uh, we're working on a uh, uh, child care family by April. We're getting a few, quite a few from the pledge session currently uh, by April, May, June, July, I don't know when. So like, we are doing our best, but. I, you know, I'll speak for, I think, the council as a whole, where we appreciate staff's work and we know you're understaffed and we know that the workload is very large and, um, you know, mountainous, if you will. And so you guys are doing an excellent job and we thank you for that. And thank you for the continued support to council and the work you do. Okay, um, before we move on, do you have anything further, Ken? Well, I. I don't want to upset the apple cart here, but do we have an idea when these tags would actually be implemented to start reviewing these off cycle rules? Well, that's a very valid question. Thank you, Ken. And uh, timeline is definitely important. So with that, um, after I just told staff how uh, big their workload is, uh, Stoyan, what do you think as far as the timing on all of this. If you're asking me if we can complete this by April, no, we can't. We we need to finish the R4 and the child care, which we are currently working on. Uh, we need to develop and publish the uh, insert pages, and we need to work and analyze bills the this year pledge session is a long session, uh, which will end in April. So we, we have to prioritize. I can't promise we I can't promise any time. I, I just we're doing the best we can. Okay. Um can so, 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 so sorry, go ahead. So so what I'm understanding here is it does not appear that you're we're going to be able to review this prior to July 1 for the off cycle rules. So I should be prepared then to put this forward again as an emergency rule at the meeting in, what is it, May? March. March. So I, I didn't say that. What I said is I can't specify a date is what I said. But for, for the sake of the rule making, Stoyan, um, I, I think that some sort of idea on whether we're going to hit July 1 or not comes into, uh, you know, that's a major factor in, in what type of, of rule we're putting forward. And so that's, I think that's the question. We can try to start, start with the uh, uh, tag review in March. Tag review in March. Okay. If, if there are no issues with the language, then it should be a quick process. And then uh, we need about uh, uh, two months after the language is uh, agreed on. We need about two months to complete, you know, with the public hearings and uh, a comment period and those kinds of things. Sure. Right, so thanks. I can't specify dates because. We're, we're just, yeah, I got you. 
Okay. All right, Corey, go ahead. I just had a question in the event that the process gets closer and we realize that we have an issue, how long does it take for an emergency rule to go into effect in order to fix it? If, if Can we put it in in May if, if we realize that it's not going to be done by July? And will it be up? How long does it take if we approve emergency rule? How long before it goes into effect? When you approve an emergency rule, staff needs time to put it together and file it with the code revisor's office. And uh, with a simple emergency rule, it takes about a week. With the emergency rule like this, I would say at least two weeks. Thank so you. So when, when the council votes on something, again, with this significant emergency rule, it will take about two weeks. It's a technical time that staff needs to prepare. I mean, if the language is everything is correct, then we don't need that much time. But my experience in the last two years, I'm still new, as you know. Uh, when we get something and we get the promise that's a done deal, then we find mistakes that we need to correct. So two weeks, it's a, a reasonable time for us to work on a uh, significant document like this. So if we did need to do something, May might be the right one. So we get it done and it gets it and it would be effective in June. And then if some, it would be covered for July. So May would be kind of a deadline to make an emergency rule to fix whatever can't get fixed through the, the rulemaking. Yes. Uh, I would say yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything further from, uh, from council? Okay, Ken, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you very much. And, and you might as well just delete me from being able to talk for the rest of the meeting. That's the plan. No, I'm just <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, Ken. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and move on from agenda item number seven. And let's head to eight, which is request for opinion. And Stoyan, do you want to lead us off on this? Uh, Krista will take over. I'm sorry, that's correct. Krista, my apologies. Okay, so this was a request that we got from the city of Bellevue um, asking for clarification on doing window to wall calculations. And they would like to know um, if you've got a case where you've got windows in like an elevator lobby going into a parking garage where you've got a separation between uh, conditioned and unconditioned space are below grade interior walls that separate conditioned space from parking areas permitted to be included in the window to wall ratio calculation and the proposed answer is unless the wall meets the definition of a below grade wall then yes, it can be considered as part of the window to wall ratio calculation. Below grade wall and above grade wall are defined terms in the energy code. In some cases, walls that are below grade are considered above grade walls per the energy code. Okay, uh, Chael, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's confusing because below grade wall is basically a wall that um, touches soil and is encloses conditioned space. And so an above grade wall can be below grade and it's kind of confusing. Um, I think the answer is, is appropriate. This is also consistent with permit, permitting practice uh, as far as I know. Um, I talked to uh, uh, doing it at the city of Seattle, and I, and I talked to Caroline Trout on the council as well. And they're, they're of the opinion that this is, this is how things are currently permitted. So if we answered differently than this, it would change uh, the way things are designed and permitted. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments from council on this? Okay, very well. And uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Joe. This is Corey, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. 
Uh, further discussion, Damon? I'm just uh, curious about procedure here. When a uh, staff makes a an offer, issues an opinion, obviously it's dated, uh, I guess that's dated January 23rd, which hasn't occurred yet. Uh, do we need to approve those? Is that typical on our procedure? That's my understanding of it, Stoyan. Uh, well, the council needs to approve. It's not well. Stuff helps with the language. Stuff starts the language, but uh, it must be approved by the council. Okay, thank you. Or, or standing committee with, with some single opinion. Standing and, committee. Yeah, this is opinion two thousand twenty three January oh one. It's not January twenty third. <laughs> thank you, Krista, for the clarification. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Katie, go ahead. Um, just a clarification. Is this, uh, what kind of workload does this give to the staff? And I just wonder, because if this is how everybody already interprets it, why do we need an opinion? That's a good question. There are things that aren't very uh, clean cut that come through, uh, but when we get a request from a jurisdiction. It, we get a request from a jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to, but in, Katie, did, did that answer your question? <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were going to speak to Katie. I, I apologize, Katie. I did not mean to cut oh. Oh, I, I just, it just, based on what Chell said, it sounded like it was already in practice that way. And so, um, you know, I don't, I don't mind voting for this if this is a clarifying um, thing for them. But at the same time, if it's workload for our staff that in a practice that's already happening, I don't really see the point. But I do think clarification is important. So. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to stop anybody. So I, I did have a question on it, Chell, and, and, and how often are they seeing this instance to where this would need to be clarified? I mean, is this a one-off and, and they're having a dispute with the designer and they're coming to the SBCC to get clarification on that? I mean, this, this seems like a very... I mean, specific item that, I mean, if it, is this happening once or twice? Is it happening, you know, half a dozen times? Is in what type of structures are they seeing this on? That would yeah. kind of be my question. Um, I'm not opposed to the opinion. I think you're correct in it, is, or it's a correct as well, but I'm just kind of curious on those items. Thank you. As you know, architects like to have lots of glass, and our clients sometimes push us to have lots of glass. And the energy code is one thing that, that tries to include a, a reasonable amount of, of glazing on buildings uh, or at least well-performing glazing on buildings. And so in the, in the pursuit of pushing as much glass as we can get under the code, which is what our clients often ask us to do, um, including below grade wall area uh, and mechanical penthouses in the window to wall ratio calculations is something that we do on most of our high rise projects. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, I would say on, on LMN's high-rise office projects and residential projects, uh, we are, we, we include this calculation and we include the below-grade walls and mechanical penthouses and other things um, in those calculations and, and submit them to the city. And they're, it's usually part of the, the window-to-wall ratio calculation. So. I don't know if that answers your question well, or if you have a different it, sub question. It, it kind of does. And I, I did have a, a sub question. Who, in this opinion, I, I, who is determining that the wall meets the definition of below grade or above grade? Is that going to, I mean, obviously, in my opinion, that would be the designer and the code official will be verifying that opinion, or, or who's making that determination? Because this is saying, if it meets the definition, well, who's determining what meets the definition in this instance? Yeah, and that's where this is. We're not saying directly that below grade interior walls that separate condition space and parking areas are to be included, but we're saying look at the definition. And if we're, we're clarifying that a below grade wall, a wall that is below grade can be an above grade wall. I think that's, that's the main point of it. 
is saying that the common understanding of a kind of an above grade wall is it is above grade, but the actual energy code definition of an above grade wall is that it could also be below the ground level. I think that's the point of this, this opinion. So I think it is it is helpful for some people who are, um, you know, maybe jurisdictions that, that don't get this very often and they're like, well, it's above, it's below grade. How can it be an above grade wall? And they look at the opinion and they say, okay, yeah, I should look at the definition. So I don't think it's trying to define anything new. It's trying to say, look at the definition and that will tell you what to do. Okay, thank you. Any uh, further discussion from council? Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure if I got if Katie got her question answered and I and or if I didn't hear it. So when we get a question that comes in, there is an answer that's presented, we vote on it. How is it then distributed to the world? Is it it, it isn't a change to the RCW, I don't believe, correct? So no, here is just, just a uh, opinion by the council. We send it to the a requester and we post it on the website and uh, local enforcing agencies are not even required to follow what the council says. Okay. So it's not part of WAC, it's not part of RCW, it's just a council opinion that uh, somebody has requested. Uh, and then, in the last, in the and then, last, and then uh, I'm oh, sorry, Roger, excuse me, I was gonna jump in for a minute to, to qualify that a little bit, if that's okay. Well, yeah, sure. It's just the net speaks to the it isn't a whole lot of effort for our for the staff. So go ahead, Dirk. I can't speak to how much effort it is for the staff in general, but I, I can say that the, the statute does direct the council or at least authorize the council uh, to um, issue opinions at the request of local building officials. Uh, it's not mandatory uh, that, you, uh, that you need to do that, but uh, it is within the powers of the of the council. And of course, it's not staff who would issue the opinions; it would be the council itself. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Micah, go ahead. I never mind. <laughs> I, if, if I'm going to go with Shelley, thinks this is good. I, I think he's correct on the answer, uh, even though it's still leaves a lot of subjective interpretation for me, but that's okay. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, with that, we will um, take a vote. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Okay, Krista, do you wanna to go to the next one? So the next one is very similar. Uh, this one is coming from the city of Battleground and is on the uh, mechanical code. And they're looking at section 403441 and asking if uh, ERVs are required in all new R2 occupancy dwelling units. And the proposed answer is no. At this time, an HRV ERV is only required for those R2 buildings that fall under the requirements of C403.3.6 of the Washington State Energy Code commercial provisions. An R2 building constructed under the residential provisions of the Energy Code are not required to provide an HRV ERV unless selected as an R406 credit option. Please note, however, that there is a scoping change under the 2021 Energy Code that will move the majority of R2 buildings under the Commercial Energy Code. Okay, thank you, Krista. Chael, go ahead. Yeah, just a little bit more explanation on that. So R2 are residential multifamily buildings, and right now if they're less than three stories, they uh, fall under the residential energy code, three stories or less, they fall under the residential energy code. Um, if they're more than three stories, then they fall under the commercial code. 
And that's the differentiator in the first couple sentences. And then the codes that we just approved for 2021 um, move R2 buildings of any size that have enclosed corridors uh, to access the units. All of those are now under now going to be under the commercial code. That's just a little bit more background on why this appears to be more complex answer than it really is. Okay, thank you. And uh, Micah, go ahead. Honestly, this answer to the first couple of sentences you were talking about, Chael, are a little confusing to me um, because there's no differentiation in scope on that story count that you indicated under section 403.36. Under 403.36, if I'm reading it correctly, pulled up, it says for all R2 dwelling units and sleeping units. There's no differentiation that says it, it, I mean, that section says that it applies to all R2s. You're indicating that technically it only applies to R2s under three stories or over three stories. I'm sorry, I, I don't remember which one you indicated, but is there more we need to add to that to include that scoping or is that just an understood scoping? Well, that's the scoping out of the commercial energy code. And where and where does it? In other words, if I read this answer as a as a lay person, or maybe this isn't for lay people, it says no at this time. ERV is only required for those R two buildings that fall under the requirements of C four hundred three point three point six. So if I go to R or if I go to C four hundred three point three point six. That says that all R2 dwellings and, and sleeping and units fall under the requirements of that section. But your answer here is no. So to me, that's confusing without the indicated scoping that says it falls under that section. You're indicating that if it falls, if the R2 falls under this, the commercial provisions of the Washington Energy Code, then it would trigger the requirements of 403 of C 40336. Is that correct? That that's where I'm not understanding the answer. Hey Michael, would it be more helpful if the third sentence was moved up and it was the second sentence? So an R2 building constructed on the residential board provisions of the Washington State Energy Code are not required to provide an HRV ERV unless selected as the R46 credit option. If that was the second sentence. Right after that seems like no. it's more, yeah, that seems like it's more to the answer of no than the section it's pointing to after the no. So I, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. It just, it, it's confusing the way it's worded. So that's helpful, Chell. Thank you for, for suggesting a modification. Okay, any further discussion on that? Uh, Damon, go ahead. Maybe we change, oh, sorry. I was just simply going to move adoption as modified. Okay. So I'll go ahead. I'll second that. Um, but I also think that, that at this time could be under the 2018 code instead of at this time. Under the 2018 code. I like that. I would accept that as well. Okay. All right. We'll second that change too. Excellent. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Any against? All right, motion carries. Okay, Stoyan, uh, do you want to go over the legislative committee report? Yes. Before we do that, uh, quickly, uh, how long do you think that's going to take? Uh, I'm having a hard time to predict those things. Yeah, so we 10 have to 15 minutes, three, perhaps. We have three bills uh, that the legislative committee wanted to have. A discussion with the council, with the full council, and uh, I sent you a complete list of bills. So it 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 may take longer. I think. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take a fifteen minute break, and then we'll come back and continue.
all here? Yes. Uh, Chell Anderson? I'm here, but I'm not Matthew Hutner. Gotcha. Uh, Jay Arnold? Here. Todd Dayruther? Here. Micah Chappelle? Uh, Tony Doan? Present. Damon Doyle? Present. I uh, don't see Al French on the attendees list still. Uh, Roger Iringa? I'm here. Matthew Hepner? Uh, Craig Holt? Don't see him in our list. Peter Ricky. Here. Katie Sheehan. Here. <clears throat> Corey Wilker. Here. Uh, Representative Wilmot Laura McCrop. <clears throat> Senator John Lovick. Representative Alex Rommel. Senator Linda Wilson and dear Mayor McCall. Well, I'm here. I'm trying to. Uh, I'll, yes. get you, I'll get your name here. here as soon as we. Well, go. I don't know if that. Yeah, I don't know if that's the problem. I'm concerned. Oh, there Matthew's in. So all right, I'll be quiet. I'm here. All right, and then I have a recall for Matthew Hepner. He's logged in. He's muted. I believe that's all we had for a recall. Micah. Well, Micah. Micah Chappelle, sorry. I, I'm here. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh oh, there's there's Matthew too. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh let's go ahead and continue with uh Agenda item number nine, which is the legislative committee report, and Stoyan and Todd will help out with that. Uh, I, I'm sure Todd will like to speak here, but uh, I sent you last night two uh, documents. One is short, one is longer. The longer document contains all bills that the SBC staff is reviewing, and uh, the short document contains only the bills that were discussed in detail at the Ledge Committee meeting yesterday. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure Todd would like to talk about it. And this, these uh, reports are shorter version. Usually when we receive a bill for analysis, we do the analysis with uh, position and recommendations, but these are staff analysis that they're not formal council analysis they are not official they, these are just working documents that are updated almost every day because uh, the bills are changing the fiscal note is changing so what you have here is just a list of the bills and a very short summary of what the bill is about okay thank you Stoyan. and i'm going to um, we'll come back. So uh, greetings, everyone. The Legislative Committee, for those that are new to the council, at least new since last session, uh, we meet every week during session uh, to you know monitor bills and 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 uh, uh, we have opportunity then to discuss as a committee the relevance of of impact potentially to uh, both the staff, the DES as an agency. Um, and then also um, as the council, our workload, so forth. Um, what we do not do unless the council um, takes action is we do not take a position as a committee. Um, and we also are, I'll use the term authorized and anyone can correct me if you'd like a different term. Um, we aren't authorized to testify. Uh, the DES uh, staff can, uh, you know, obviously as an agency, they, they have a role uh, to inform. And so I think there's two things we'd like to do today, we're proposed to do as a committee. 
uh, and bring it to the council. Um, this is obviously our next meeting is March, so it's um, it'll be towards the end of session, right? So, um, and that's one of the challenges during during session is that uh, um, council doesn't meet frequently enough to to be relevant to um, um, to inform bills or take a position unless we want to authorize um, the legislative committee uh, and or the chair of the council, the chair of the committee to uh, to be able to uh, represent the, the council. So I think it's two things today. Let um, if, if the council can discuss and potentially take action, if, if, if you if we want a grant authorization um, for that. And then the second part is then let's dig into a, a couple of the bills, the actual content of the bills um, if it's a desire to um, to discuss in this meeting, is any any of that inaccurate, um, particularly Stoyan and Tony? I don't think so. You are perfect. Yeah. Okay. So before we get in the weeds on on any of the bills, and 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 quickly, uh, you know, I'll throw it to Stoyan to to we can skim over the bills we've been monitoring, and then maybe dig into three that we think are relevant. Um, does anyone have a position on 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 um, granting the chair of the council and or the chair of the committee, legislative committee, to um, be able to represent the council. Um, and again, when we say represent, our, our, I think we came to a, a position yesterday in the legislative committee um, that doesn't, obviously we're not um, taking a position without the council taking action. It is rather informing um and and raising concerns um potentially to legislators or to to uh legislative staff i'll leave it there for input okay damon go ahead uh, thank you mr chairman i'm looking at the document that we discussed early in the meeting uh which was the sbcc 2024 tag and committee members and i scrolled down to legislative committee and hey lo and behold i'm on it and did not know that uh <laughs> it looks like it's made up of the uh uh, committee chair, uh, council chair, council vice chair, BFP, MVE, and two committee members and one ex officio. Is this the current makeup of this, our current legislative committee, just for confirmation? Yes. Okay. Uh, that was my primary question. Um, Todd, in response to your comment, I mean, th this is this is a good group. Um, However, it is less than half of the SBCC, so I would I would be concerned in some of the more controversial pieces of legislation, not having the full council weigh in before we take a position one way or the other. I guess that's my thoughts off the cuff. Uh, if I may respond, Chair, it, absolutely. Um, I, I think it would be a f overreach to have the committee take a position for the council. Um, I think the the discussion yesterday was rather um, to have to authorize the chair of the council and potentially the chair of the committee to sit in on on an informed potential meeting and so forth and and raise with this with the staff of uh, um, potential concerns or areas of where we might have questions to bring back to the to the council. So but thank you for clarifying, Damon. Yes. Go ahead, Damon. And when you Todd, when you say raise with, with the staff, you're talking about our staff, internal staff, not legislative. Okay, yeah. You know, and and Stoyan, maybe um, I don't think Anne is on here, but but maybe you can also elaborate a little bit on on potential authorization you would need to to represent the council. I see, and I see Anne is here. I don't I don't know if she wants to talk or she wants me to talk. And or so, can we at least introduce Anne to everyone? Because that, that also would be important. Can, did you promote her? I tried to promote her. I can you guys hear me? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. It was not letting me to join the, the panel. So uh, hello. Um, and I'm not getting on screen, but I'll try here in a minute to restart my computer. Uh, my name is Ann Larson, and I am the Assistant Director of Policy and Government Relations. And I oversee the work of the State Building Code Council, and I help facilitate um, if there are 
issues with implementation or if there are resource issues um, with bills that are impacting the State Building Code Council and try to raise those uh, two different legislatures, uh, the legislature members um, with their bills. So I'm here to help facilitate some of those discussions and looking forward to this discussion. Okay, thank you, Ann. Okay, so again, um, any discussion on, on um, or concerns, it would take council action in my understanding to, um, to authorize, you know, representation of the council. Is that correct? I, I believe so. How we did it last year, uh, I do the bill analysis with the rest of the team, the, the uh, SBCC staff, and uh, our uh, recommendations and opinion is based on the technical provisions of the bill. We don't take position based on whether or not it's a good bill or a bad bill. I share my analysis with uh, the uh, legislative committee. Uh, we have interesting discussions and then very often it ends right there. Uh, for the last session, I, I testified, I think, twice, providing, uh, again, technical uh, uh, comments on the technical requirements, sometimes effective uh, dates. Uh, sometimes the sponsors of the bills reach out uh, uh, and uh, I again provide uh, uh, technical recommendations, but uh, I don't uh, take positions and I, I want to be very careful uh, if the council wants to authorize me to take position on something, I would need a clear, uh, a clear guidance from the council what the position is. So again, currently uh, staff concentrates on the technical issues. This is how it worked last year. This is how we started the session this year. Um, Todd, during this section, if you just want to call on people to raise their hand. Go oh, okay, ahead. thank you. Yep. Okay, Micah, please. Thanks. I, I'm kind of processing what Stoyan just said. I think he somewhat answered my questions on, on positions and and how he would effectively represent us or, or someone who would effectively represent us at these hearings. Um, I, I don't know. I do have some concerns on how that will go especially based on some of the bills we have reviewed and the impact that they could really have. And I, I don't know. So I just got to process that a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I think some of the neutral positions would not be a, a benefit to our work as code development and code enforcement. So thanks. I And it, it um, go ahead, Damon. Uh, Todd, if you wanted to respond to Micah first, that's fine. No, I think it's better to get input, and then we'll we'll circle back. Thank you. Uh, I actually had a question. Um, for the last twenty years, I've uh, testified multiple times on behalf of our industry, and I've already been reached out to by phone um, on a particular piece of legislation that was considered by the legislative committee. Um, what is the, uh, since we've all gone through ethics training and, you know, all these fun things, what, what, what is the proper way for an individual to testify on their own behalf while also being a member of this committee? And by the way, is my screen flickering on your guys' end too? Yeah. I've got, I got a really bad connection today. I'm going to just turn that off. Um, yeah, you know, so if I were to go and introduce myself as a as a home builder and a representative of the residential construction industry and also a member of the building code council, is that appropriate? We need you need to specify in our I will ask Dirk if, if he has something uh, uh, better to provide, but you need to specify that you're not representing the council at, uh, uh, at this testimony, you are sharing your your opinion and not the council uh, position. And that's and that's technical, and I'm always clear on that. So, okay, just uh, want a clarification. Yeah, if, I just want to jump in, Damon. That's a really good question. I, I would want everybody to know, of course, that you haven't lost your First Amendment rights to be able to speak on issues because you're a member of the the council. The ethics question would come uh, not so much from the testifying, but on taking uh, potentially taking votes in which there's a conflict. And so um, 
that would be where the analysis would be. And so you always want to be careful as we've gone through training and we've discussed before that uh, whenever you, you take an action as a as a council member, that that action uh, doesn't appear to have a conflict of interest with a, a, you know personal interest as, as defined under the ethics laws. I don't know if that was particularly helpful, but uh, I don't want anybody to feel like they're precluded from testifying on issues. I won't put my soapbox, soapbox up for auction on eBay then. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Katie, please. Yeah, um, so just to loop back to the type of testimony that we're authorizing. So it would be mostly around like, um, for example, you know, I'm looking at this um, SBC bill analysis summary report. And you'd go in there and say, this has some or no, no policy or operational impacts to us, or it has major ones, depending on the assessment of the legislative committee. But you wouldn't give an opinion about what the bill actually, what, what your thoughts are or what our thoughts are on the bill. Is that kind of a, a rough assessment of what Katie, in my opinion, that, that's a good way to frame it, because if, if you listen in on most of our discussions on the legislative committee, they, they are technical in nature of, of how that process could be implemented through our rulemaking, you know, for example. Um, so I think it, it, a lot of it would be under the category of informing, um, you know, how that could happen, or perhaps is this most appropriate in the IRC versus the IBC, for example, when we get into, you know, talking about a couple of these bills, um, it would have, in my opinion, it would have to be the full council action to take a, 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 a position on, on a bill on the subject matter. But in the legislative committees, we do, we do express our opinions in, in, in order to try to better understand what is being proposed. Um, let's go. Is, is that is that? Uh, a yeah, that's help? great. Thanks. Okay, I think that's good. Let's go, Sheldon. Micah, please. Yeah, I guess what I've been coached to say when I testify is that I am a member of the Building Code Council, but I'm not representing the views of the Building Code Council, and that seems to that's kind of the way I've been coached. Correct. I've I've testified this session already for my for my company and and then expressed or shared my credentials um, and for transparency as, as a member of the State Building Co. Council. Uh, Micah? Thanks. I, I, I do kind of have similar concerns as Katie, Katie had. Katie, sorry for mispronouncing. Um, but, uh, and others, I mean, we've talked about this before. I think that some of our positions are clear on some of these legislation, legislative items, and, and it wouldn't be hard to testify as such. I mean, the HB 1167 came in as a proposal that went through the tag process, our committee process, and the council process, and got denied across the board. And now they're trying to force that through legislation. So uh, to me, some of those are, that, that, that pretty much says what the council's opinion is on, on some of those items. But um, I, I, I I struggle a lot with where we would fall on neutral just based on how it would affect, say, SBCC staff. Because um, I think that SBCC staff and, and, and has the technical knowledge to understand some of these things. Yes, they're good in intent, but they're not functional as code language or code development or, you know, going completely against historical process that can't be you know, modified without significant justification other than we just need to do this for a housing emergency. Um, so, so I think some of these are clear and I'm, I'm okay with giving uh, a significant leeway to Stoyan uh, on testifying on, on some of the, on our behalf as a whole, because I, I do think that he does, that you do Stoyan see beyond just the, how does this affect SBCC staff is like, how is this technically feasible when you look at the cut with the legislative language? So thanks. Thank you, Micah. Jay? Beyond the um, general items, to Micah's point, I think we have four bills we want to bring forward to have that kind of specific authorization on, on position. So I, I'm wondering if, if you're going to bring that up yep. uh, separately. Thank you. I, I, th I think 
That was my next step, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, perhaps it's helpful if we just move into discussion on the four bills, and then we we can come back on 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 what would appropriate uh, representation look like. I, I agree, Jay. Thank you. So with that, uh, Stoyan, um, uh, unless anyone on the council requests this, I don't think we need to go through the entire list, do we? Um, since since you shared them, or we we absolutely can, and do twenty seconds on 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 the on on each one, and then dive into the three or four we discussed yesterday. Whatever, whatever you want, I sent you both. I sent you the complete list just to let you know how many bills are around, and the short list with a little bit more uh, uh, comments added to the summary. So. I can I can use either one. I can go through all the long list. I can go. But let's list. let's let's go through you know 20, 30 seconds on each to give a flavor for the the breadth of it, and then and then dive deep on the short list, please. Okay. Uh, HB 1085 plastic pollution. Uh, it requires the council to adopt rules that require bottle filling stations. Mm -hmm. uh, everywhere where drinking fountains are required. This is the requirement. Uh, we met with the sponsor of the bill before this bill was introduced. Uh, she was nice enough to change the effective date, so we didn't need to do a cycle rule. Uh, it will align with the 2024 code adoption cycle. Currently, we have requirements for bottle filling stations, uh, but they are not for all uh, buildings. These are for uh, E offices. Uh, the next one is middle housing. So the bill doesn't really have any mandates for the State Building Code Council. And from the council staff perspective, we think that there are some definitions and provisions in the bill that may create conflicts with the Washington Building Codes and then may require the council to act on some of these uh, uh, conflicts. Again, the evaluation is in a, a staff perspective. For example, we have middle housing here defined, and at the same time in other bills, we have uh, multiplex housing. Uh, the definition of townhouses doesn't align with the residential code. The definition of residential code, it's very important because it changes the requirements and actually mandates more stringent requirements than how it is in the residential code. So I'm not I'm not commenting on the intent. I think our bills have good intent. Uh, these are just the technicalities that uh, I want to I want to share. Uh, so this is for this bill. I'm going to the next one. Uh, let me see. Uh, HB 1167. So this was the one that the legislative committee wanted to discuss in detail with the council. So Todd, if I can skip those and then we can go back to them, is it, yeah. is it all right? I think that's a good idea, thanks. Okay, uh, the next one is 1193. So the 1193 is related to the energy code. Uh, it's a it's a long bill uh, containing several uh, new sections, uh, and uh, it, it's basically related to the authority of the State Building Code Council to consider green gas greenhouse gas emissions as a factor for code adoption. And uh, there is another important message here in this bill, the State Building Code Council shall not restrict nat natural gas or natural gas appliances in residential construction unless specifically directed to do so uh, by the legislature. Uh, this is the, uh, the summary the summary of the bill. It will have uh, uh, policy and operational impacts and it will have some fiscal impact. I have it in my evaluation more than $50,000 because it will require a reevaluation of the uh, currently adopted uh, uh, energy code. Uh, the next one is HB 1298. This is one of these three that the committee wanted to discuss with the council, so I will, I will skip it. Uh, HB 1404, 
this is uh, a companion bill to uh, Senate Bill 5117. This is uh, the bill that was uh, uh, submitted by, uh, introduced by uh, Senator uh, Linda Wilson. So I'll skip it. I'll skip HB 1404, but I will spend a little bit more time when I get to SB 5117. Uh, the next one is HB 1409. Uh, this bill requires the council to immediately adopt our four offensive group as detailed in the International Building Code Section 3105. Uh, this bill, you know that we are currently working with the Department of Health and uh, we are doing our best to establish a work group and uh, start with a based code language that we can uh, Propose for the technical advisory groups and the council uh, to uh, evaluate. So this bill concentrates on R4, but actually only the adoption of R4 is an easy task. Uh, but based on the conversation that we had in the last three council meetings, it appears that only R4 adoption won't be enough to address our issues with uh, uh, licensed care facilities. And I, I will leave it. I will leave it there. The message was passed to the sponsor of the bill that we're currently working on it and uh, uh, with or without this uh, uh, bill uh, being approved or disapproved, we will do our due diligence and uh, uh, comply with the council's direction. The next one is SB uh, 5037. So this bill adds a new mandate for the state building code council specifying that the Washington State Energy Code may not prohibit the use of natural gas for any form of heating or for uses related to any appliance in any uh, building. Uh, so the short comment here is that if adopted, it will, if approved, it will require the council to repeal recently approved the requirements for heat pumps uh, pertaining to space heating and water, and water heaters. Uh, the next one is uh, SB 5117. Again, it was the sponsor is uh, Senator uh, 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 Linda Wilson. Uh, she's uh, our ex official member. Uh, the bill makes actually proposes changes to the SBCC policies and procedures with the intent to streamline the process uh, pertaining to the submittal of proposals, evaluation of proposals, and adoption of. Uh, proposals uh, from the staff standpoint the bill has some good ideas in it related to the policies and procedures and there are some other things that I can't comment they are good or bad they just will bring some uh, additional uh, workload and fiscal uh, impact uh, to the council and we saw some potential conflicts with the current law, but again, this is this is where I, I want to stop. I, I don't want to comment in detail the uh, intent of uh, this bill. So going going further, uh, policy and operational impact, I have it as major because the bill will require uh, staff to develop, to reorganize and uh, well, overhaul the current bylaws and policies and procedures. And it has fiscal impact more than 50,000 because it will require longer time uh, to do this work. Is, uh, Joe, sorry, I, I'm on my screen, so I don't see your hand. But if it's yeah, a, I guess the, the piece here that, that says something about the register lobbyists, I was just wondering. Are there current council members that are registered lobbyists that if this passed would be immediately kicked off the council? I'm, I'm just asking that because I, I just don't know what that, that impact is. I, I, I can't answer this question. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how it works now. It's just one of, one of this, well, there is, there, there is another one that I didn't comment, but uh, the bill would require uh, set confirmation for the the managing director. So uh, there are. It's a long bill. I just don't want to go through every every single section. Uh, but 
it, it will require some work on the council side to modify its policies and procedures. This is for sure. Uh, SB 5190 is House Bill 1110, which we will discuss in detail later. Uh, 5158 is uh, uh, a companion bill to, nine, uh, to 1298, which will, again, I will spend more time. And then uh, uh, 5416 uh, is a companion of uh, 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 House Bill 1409, which, which I already talked about. So when I go to Todd, do you want to take over for the book? Nope. I, th I think let's let's um, jump to eleven sixty seven. Is that the first one you think? Uh, I have I have HB eleven ten. Eleven ten. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm happy to discuss this a little bit, um, and then and then I'll hand it back to you, Stoyan. So eleven ten is is the is the missing middle. Um, came back from from last year. Um, four plexes up to six plexes. You know, given certain. Um, um certain conditions of of transit so forth um again we we discussed in the committee that we saw this primarily of course as a as a planning um you know and land use and zoning uh, uh, bill but obviously um you'll see the relation are to other other bills that that do ask for uh, the development of life safety building code and residential code so forth uh to be compatible uh with where where the state is seems to be moving or other jurisdictions such as city of spokane uh, already have moved in in this direction so uh anything else going on this bill you or anyone else would like to discuss well, my side, no i have i have everything in the summary you see yep. any comments from the um, council any questions no, go ahead katie yeah, just so just as an example, this would be an opportunity for you to make this bill better by educating them about the definition, perhaps, and making it, you know, kind of align with what's required for the SBC C rules. Or is is that kind of the intent of your 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 testimony if you were to go in there? Yeah, and in this case, I think it's already in in, in you know the authority right as a des or sbcc staff you know as a state agency to inform you know form this type of uh technical input right right that's really great okay thank you i'm not sure there's a, a real need quite frankly from the council to to inform anything on on this bill in particular yeah. the the position my position was and Again, I, I do the analysis for DES and it, it follows the uh, uh, the path of travel going to the sponsor, I guess, and Anne is here if she can clarify the, the procedure. But uh, the, the recommendation was the, this definition can be modified to align with the, with the model code. And uh, 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 this uh, requirements uh, for uh, local jurisdictions to uh, approve four to six units on a, on a, on a single lot um, could be more clear to provide uh, a direction how uh, this is connected to the building codes because uh, there are other requirements in the building codes. Uh, some are related to uh, size of the buildings. So we may end up with modifying the residential code because of this bills. Again, that that was the initial uh, the initial review. Thank you. And if I could, uh, for a lot of these kinds, and this was one we have not reached out to Representative Bateman as of yet, uh, but this is one where we can definitely provide feedback and it doesn't even necessarily need to be on um, in a public hearing as testimony. It's reaching out directly to the legislator and legislative staff to help uh, bring about uh, positive changes to technically correct the bill. But yeah, that's exactly so, uh, Katie, that was a, a great suggestion. So it's just trying to figure out what the State Building Code Council is authorizing uh, Stoyan to do and just being very clear about um, what are the issues where we can really go on the record, whether it be in testimony, uh, via email to the prime sponsor, however that may be, just trying to get clarity. 
Okay, Jay. Do you feel like you need a motion to authorize um, the the chair, managing director, or legislative chair to inform on technical issues on definitions and requirements? Um, Tony, may I push this to you as chair of the council to uh, guide? Yes, I, it's my understanding that it, it probably would be worthy of a motion and the best way to go about it. Okay. Is that, is that so, the question, Jay? Yeah, so yeah. then I'll make a motion that we authorize uh, the chair, the legislative chair and the managing director to offer uh, testimony to inform on technical issues with definitions and requirements on HB 1110 and Senate Bill 5190. Jay, may I um, <clears throat> propose that we also would include the chair of the council? That's what I, when I said the chair, that's who I was uh, referring to. Okay. The, the, I, what I'd like to be able to get is uh, uh, Tony and Todd, uh, you two to figure out who who's the one to, to, to speak or story and who's the one to speak. But the intention would be to uh, enable all three of you to do so as appropriate. Okay. Um... Before I'll second we, that if it needs a second. Thank you, Micah. That's what I was looking for. And with that, we'll open it up for discussion. Craig, go ahead. Uh, so point of question. <clears throat> the uh, motion currently says to inform and to testify. I thought I thought we were asking them to go informally inform them without necessarily having to testify. Can somebody clarify that for me? Craig, I'll, well, I'll I can, just, oh, go ahead, Jay. Yeah. I'll just speak to the, the intention. I want to give the flexibility to to be able to do testimony in any form uh we it's going to be a, a dynamic session and um i am deliberately silent on a position on the issue but uh certainly would be able to <clears throat> testify with um with concerns and feedback so i appreciate the flexibility but they can go just inform back you know they can go have the meeting as she has and described just inform directly and or testify is your intent Yes. Cool. Thank you. And if, if I could, um, often tactically, we will go in, like I said, uh, write letters to the committee, speak to the prime sponsor directly, and if needed to go specifically on the record, then um, via public testimony, but often just a conversation with the prime sponsor, um, whether via meeting or an email, um, that's typically how the agencies um, uh, work on a lot of the legislation. We don't necessarily have to go out um, on public testimony, but certainly that's an option as well. So just at different bills, different tactical options. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate it. Uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, and as I understand the motion, it does not include taking a position on the, in other words, the position is neutral. It is not for or against, but it is providing technical feedback. Okay, I see nodding, so I'm going to assume that's a yes. And then my other question, my assumption based on past, uh, uh, I guess, practice has been that the, the managing director, Soyan, can at any point provide technical feedback to sponsors and, and others about any of these bills without prior motions being made by the council. Is that is that generally a true statement? I would say yes, with one exception here. I try to be very careful the feedback I provide. Without, without the council clear direction. So for this particular bill, I would say, for example, uh, can you please modify the definition of townhouses? Here is the issue with the residential code. Can you please coordinate with other bills? And I can cite the bills because there is an issue with the same type of uh, uh, housing defined differently in different bills. And then I would ask uh, if a clearer language can be provided, uh, how this uh, mandate for uh, you know, four to six dwelling units per each residential lot will 
codifying language and that. This is what, why, what I can say. Uh, but I, I, I don't go above and beyond that to provide, you know, any uh, suggestions yeah. to change the intent or anything like that. Just to, to clarify, yep. the maker of the motion, Jay, that that is your intent when you mentioned flexibility. Absolutely. Thank you. Go ahead, Joe. No, but, but the motion itself is only for two bills, and I'm asking a more general question about. We, I mean, my assumption is that Soyan always has the right and ability, and and we want him to be providing feedback to bill sponsors and others on how this affects the council and how it affects the rules that we we implement um, with the input of the legislative committee, but sometimes without direct input or authorization of the of the legislative committee. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that or that if my assumptions are incorrect, that, that somebody corrects me. I think your assumptions are correct for this bill. I'm not sure that they would be um, for other motions if we are explicit in our direction. But that would be okay, my understanding I, for this bill as a, as a general information. I, I, not, I think this is a more general thing and I, I think Stan needs to be able to provide immediate and timely and you know technical feedback to sponsors because these bills move around quite quickly and I don't think we should hamstring the executive the director's ability to provide technical feedback to bill sponsors and others by requiring prior authorization for a specific bill in general for this one maybe we're going above and beyond and so we want a motion for it but in general my understanding is Dan can provide feedback without specific direction of the council or the legislative committee. And that's based on a, a couple of years of working with this and, and seeing how dynamically these bills change and how the right amount of feedback at the right time can 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 make a bill much better. So I'm I'm hoping that that's the case and, and if somebody thinks it's not the case, I would like to know. I would love to just jump in here. Um, I think folks uh, know that the State Building Code Council has become a, a direct report to me, and I oversee Stoyan's work. And in doing so, it highlights um, the importance of the State Building Code Council and the legislation that is often in front of them, um, and just politically, you know, some of the challenges associated with that. So I think for me, given that this is a new direct report to me, having that clear, uh, the clarity there to understand what is something that Stoyan can do as far as providing that, just as a general rule. I know we're speaking specifically to this bill and there's a motion on the table, but just in general, having a, some clarity as to um, what the State Building Code Council is authorizing Stoyan as the State Building Code Council manager and me helping facilitate um, just in general. And then, you know, the bills of concerns, there's, there's a different tactic that would go with that, but, um, but exactly to that point. Well, does that <clears throat> clear that up? Joe. Um, yeah, I guess what I heard is this passing this motion will help. And after this motion, making another motion that provides more clarity to Anne on how we would like Stoyan to be able to interact with um, bill sponsors and others would be helpful. Okay. All right. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Uh, I was sorry. I should lower my hand. I, I think I lost where I was and what we're doing. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, my intention with this motion is to be additive and really cross the line to say, public testimony which may be written or or uh, at a hearing on behalf of the council 
uh, and not to impact Stoyan's ability to uh, offer some feedback as managing director, has, as he's done on about a dozen different bills through the DES process already um, uh, that uh, was in the full list that he circulated. Thank you. Todd, go ahead. Thank you. I would uh, ask for clarification in the motion. Is it bill specific? Um, and if so, is there a way to do it uh, more broadly based on recommendations by the legislative committee? And as we know, by the time the council meets it, Again, you know, some of these bills potentially will even merge together. And, and so looking for how we would deal with that flexibility if that happens. Thank you. Micah, if you want to add to that, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I was going to ask Todd, can that be in a separate motion? Um, I, I don't think it's necessary for the motion on this specific bill. It sounds like uh, Stoyan understands what we're, what the intent is for this one, and then we could go into what the overall expectations of Stoyan is, or, or Anne for that matter, um, for the bills moving forward. So Mike, uh, if, if I may uh, chair, um, so is that clarification that this motion is about this specific bill only? Two bills. So Jay- I mean the two companion bills, sorry, yeah. yes. Yep, okay, thank you. And And this motion also includes other people who are who are included in providing feedback. Yes, that's correct. Okay, any further comment with the motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Hearing none, motion carries. Go ahead, Todd. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, moving to the next bill then, um, 1167, I believe. Yep. Um, this bill has gone through public testimony in, in house housing. Uh, this one uh, directly affects the State Building Code Council as it is, um, it is um, asking to convene a work group. Uh, for the purpose of, as you can read there, for, for looking at um, either the IRC or the, well, it, it's specific is for the IRC to include um, typologies up to up to six plexes in the, in the, in the residential code. And so there's been, uh, we had deep discussion about this as a, as a committee. Um, this is one where we feel we could strongly as a council inform and, and, and help um, guide whether it, it would be an IRC pathway or an IBC with exception, you know, pathways. Just for example, without presupposing where 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 this would go. Uh, so I'll um, open this one up to um, well, Stoyan, if you have any comments, and then open it up to the council for any questions. Before I get to eleven sixty seven, Anne needs to leave in ten minutes, and if if the council have questions for her or. Uh, I just want to use the opportunity she's here because she's a great source of information and uh, just sure. we want to use her wisely. Agreed. Thank you, Stoy. And uh, Shell? Yeah, I would like to make a motion to specifically authorize uh, Stoy uh, to provide technical feedback uh, and impact on the council to bill sponsors. Uh, stakeholders and other legislators um, not taking positions for or against, but simply providing neutral um, feedback based on the technical, technical ramifications for the council and for the, the codes in general and, and that kind of thing. So that's that's a motion I'd like to specifically authorize. Uh, so I am to do that. Uh, Shell, and in, in, in that, if I can ask, you know, is your intention to, unlike the last motion, not to include the chair of the council and the chair of the legislative committee? I guess I'm just trying to encapsulate prior practice 
into this, and I, I think we can have a good discussion on whether we want other people included in that. I'm, I'm fine with that, but I want to have a discussion on it before I include it in the motion. Thank you. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and second. We will open it up for discussion. Uh, Jay, go ahead. And just I look at this as a the catch all that we're discussing to say we want to make sure that in addition to the positions that we take as a council on specific bills that uh, Stoyan's got uh, free reign to offer feedback on the full superset of other bills that impact the council and our work. Um, Micah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to jump in if you didn't want to. Um, I, I agree with the motion. I think the story should have this latitude. However, I think this will come into a bigger discussion, and, and maybe that's a, a question for Ann or, or maybe a, a request for participation in the future um, because this has come up in the past, and that is the question of what is the SBCC's director's role and staff is it, it, on supporting the SBCC or participating in the SBCC or other items of concern. I know I'm not the only one that have, has mentioned this in the past, and and I think some of that is um, part of Senator Wilson's bill that we may not discuss, may or may not discuss today. Um, intent as well as is to kind of define those roles and expectations from the director and from staff and and you know if that was in those list or or uh information on expectations or duties or or whatever um then we probably wouldn't have to have this discussion further in the future thanks okay uh todd go ahead well, I would I would raise the the concern that um, that we're not including at least the chair of the council in in that in that motion. I think that's that's the the challenge is that we have representation, and we don't put um, staff, and in this case, the managing director, in 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 an uh, an uncomfortable or uh, position without the support of council representation. And, and I have to leave here uh, for my own leadership legislative coordination, um, but I do want to just um, thank you for being part of this discussion. I'm happy to be a resource, but also to remind folks that um, as a cabinet agency, there are limitations to the kind of support that I can provide the State Building Code Council just in general, because I'm a cabinet agency and work for our um, Governor Inslee. So, um, but I look forward to working with the council to just make sure that um, we're already doing quite a bit of outreach to legislators just to continue that practice to provide that technical support, but just giving Stoyan um, and other folks to the council a little bit more clarity on how we do so. But I have to leave. So I just appreciate the discussion and want to say thank you. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, Ann. Thank you for your time. Micah, go ahead. Thanks. And thanks, Ann. Uh, well, she jumped off. Um, I, I did want to kind of talk about what Todd mentioned in. in I think that comes down to our schedule and what we need to authorize or do during the legislative cycle. In other words, I believe that the intent of the legislative committee is to allow that latitude to either the committee members or the committee chair, which would in turn be the, as, as well as the council chair without having to explicitly state that that would be that that would be my, my understanding and intent of the legislative committee if it's not then i think we need to revise our sbcc the full council schedule to meet more often during the legislative cycle so the full council can vote on positions specifically on bills because uh, as you all are aware this this body this board is becoming a a almost a political football and <laughs> there seems to be a lot more bills that are geared or aimed towards the SBCC based on our actions. So um, maybe that's, you know, options we need to look at is, is increasing our full council meetings during the legislative cycle. Maybe they're shorter. Um, we, and we only deal with the legislative items during those meetings, but, um, or we just straight across say, Hey, we authorize the folks on that legislative committee to make those decisions on behalf of the entire SBCC. 
Some people may not be comfortable with that and that's fine, but we need to address that in our bylaws and process changes that Stoyan's, you know, that's further down the agenda today for, for work group discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Katie. Right. I, I think I'm going to echo what um, Micah just said. It seems like um, I don't really know the difference between what we just did in the last bill specifically and then this one, HB um, 1167, granting the same authorization to the legislative committee chair, our Tony and Stoyan um, across the board seem to educate um, however necessary to make bills better. Seems like a kind of can go across the board on all of these bills. It's whether or not we want to make a an opinion as a board together today on any of these, right? Um, so could, could we do that um, instead of going through each one and authorizing everybody on an education basis first and then going back through or is that, am I trying to bypass something that needs to happen? Um, I think clarifying, maybe if I'm getting this right. Chell, will you clarify your motion? Yeah, the motion is to explicitly authorize uh, the managing director to provide feedback uh, and comments to bill sponsors and other stakeholders that are preparing bills for the legislature um, with input from the legislative committee, but specific authorization so that that he can he can do that without specific direction from the council itself or the legislative committee itself. Yeah. Okay. And Katie, you mentioned something about each bill and giving authorization. Does that kind of that that solves it for me. So at this point okay. it's really just deciding whether or not we would like you as the chair and Todd as the chair of the legislative committee to at, be added to that authorization for all the bills or anything that comes up. Correct. That was one of the comments and discussion from Todd, but Chael's motion is only had, yeah, only Stoyan. That's correct. Yes. Okay. I, I think I was the second on that motion. In my understanding of the intent, Chael, just to correct me if I'm wrong, for my second would be that you're providing Stoyan kind of a general approval to provide information on these bills without taking position. Um, mm -hmm unless the That's position correct. is directed by either the legislative committee or the full council. And that, that was my understanding and that's why I seconded it. So it's, it's kind of, hey, you, Storian, go talk to whoever you need to talk to to provide general information on the best interests of the SBCC and our practices and policies without taking a position. We're all good with that. I think that was my understanding and that was my second. That's correct. Okay, <clears throat> very well. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Um, you know, Katie brings up some good points. I think one of the reasons why we're looking at these bills individually is even though we had no position on HB 1110, there may be other bills that we want to take a position on. And, and so I, I think that's going to be something the council has to um, authorize explicitly. Uh, to Micah's point for future discussions of saying, you know, does the building code council need to meet more frequently during legislative session or do we want to enable the legislative uh, committee to do things? The way that this has worked in other um, uh, organizations, including my city, is that, um, and to consider for the future in the bylaws discussion is adopting a legislative agenda that says in bills of these categories, here's the SBC's position. Um, and that would give kind of the the authority without um, and allowing us to have a discussion as a council of the sort of bills we want to get involved in. But for the moment, the bills that we're talking about today that have come through the legislative committee are bills that have committee hearings that are moving the, that we, we think we want to weigh in on. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Pete, go ahead. 
Yeah, I, I guess I, you know, most of these bills seem like they are asking the SBC to redefine something or create a new category, uh, a new type of building or land use or whatever. And I was at a planning council meeting last night where exactly that same kind of thing occurred. Uh, I think we should allow our legislative representative and Stoyan to comment on those, but some of these bills directly affect the operation of the SBCC and our, uh, I think those need to be separated out and discussed separately. So lumping all of these together in one pile doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I think we need to be careful about that. But so an organization of most of these into are just simply directing the SBCC to do something that the in, intended author wants done as far as multiplexes or resident residential requirements uh, but others are directly directly focused at the operation of the SBCC and those need to be considered separately thank you Pete any further discussion with the motion Okay, with that, we will uh, take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Nay. Uh, Craig Holt with the nay. Correct. Nay also. <clears throat> Corey Wilker, nay. Uh, to make this easier on staff, would you like to do a roll call? Or will that suffice? Mr. Chair, could you restate the motion, please? Yes, Damon. Um, sorry, I lost it. Chell, please restate your motion. <clears throat> the motion is to, um, I guess, consistent with past practice, authorize the managing director to provide technical feedback to bill sponsors and, and other stakeholders in the bill creation and legislative process. Technical feedback, but not for or against feedback to remain neutral. For all bills um, that might affect the, the council or the codes in Washington. Thank you, Joe. Without restriction. Thank you. And, and to take into account, of course, the uh, legislative committee's input, basically uh, funneling the legislative committee's input and other technical knowledge you might have to those stakeholders I mentioned. Okay, uh, it's Damon. Did you did you vote yay or nay? I did not because I, I was confused as to the content. And quite frankly, uh, Chell, your explanation made the motion just a little bit more muddier. Is there any way to distill it down and make it more concise? It basically, a lot of bills come through the legislature and they go quickly and. Having a person, I think the managing director is the right person, be able to provide instant feedback and considered feedback from the legislative committee to people working on bills is is really important. So that's the kind of the, the why. And then the motion is to have the managing director be able to provide feedback to <clears throat> sponsors and people working on bills on technical issues about those bills, about the working of the council and how they affect the codes and in, in, in the constellation around the codes in the state, providing those that kind of technical feedback. I don't know if it's, I can make it simpler than that. Sorry. <laughs> Did somebody write that down? I'm not being facetious. <laughs> So as I understand the motion, it's to allow the managing director and or the chair of the count or of the committee to provide technical feedback without opinion on the substance of the bill. Is that correct? Yes, except for the motion specifically only includes the managing director. Um, I'd be happy to talk about also including the, the chair in that if we wanted to. Uh, so I would I would I gotta, welcome that discussion. I, I gotta okay, wait, I gotta pause this because we've 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 technically ended discussion and we've went into the vote. 
And so I need clarification on Robert's rule on what to do now because we have council members that did not vote because they were still confused, but we ended discussion. And so um, maybe Derek can help me out with this or someone who's well versed in Robert's rule as far as uh, how to open this back up if I'm allowed to, or if we have to take a roll call to clarify who's voting yay or nay or abstaining. Point of order. Go ahead. Uh, I think at this point, we're trying to clarify the motion. We're no longer discussing it. We're we're asking for clarification. And uh, what I've heard so far has been more than a run on sentence. So I'm just simply asking for simple clarification of the motion being voted on. Micah, go ahead. Sorry, I'll try to be succinct in what I, my understanding intent and intent was as the second is this would authorize Stoyan or the, whoever the director is of the SBCC to more or less provide general inform, informative items to bill sponsors and, uh, on SBCC process and issues that come up in bills that directly affect SBCC without taking a position. In other words, it's just for information purposes only. It says, this is the SBCC process and here's how you would modify it. It's not to provide a position that says we are for or against this unless the director is explicitly told to do so by either a vote at the legislative committee, if we approve that, or the full council. That's my understanding. Is that is that simple enough? It is. Oh, maybe. With, with okay. explanation. Uh, <laughs> traditionally, when a motion is made, it should appear in the minutes of the next meeting as a sentence that says a motion was made to X. And so <laughs> that's why I'm trying to distill it down to simple language. And Tony, it's it's Derek Marabach. I know you had a specific question because uh, we have a little bit of a conundrum here. You were we were in mid vote before uh, questions came regarding the clarification, and you're just looking for the procedural method to kind of reboot this and get you know, back on track. Yeah, I'm looking for Robert's rules right now. I'm not saying anything specifically, uh, so I could spend another minute doing that. If somebody with some uh, experience uh, specifically that issue has some thoughts, uh, I'm interested in hearing it. Yes, please do, Derek. That would be great. I mean, my understanding is we voted on a motion, but that doesn't preclude anybody else from making another motion. That would, you know, rescind the priorly passed motion or, or doing something else. I guess the result of the vote was not stated by the chair, so there is no result on the vote. Um, it seemed to pass based on the voice vote, but you'd ask for a roll call vote and that never happened. Right. I uh, that, that was my next I step. Really I was going to go to roll call just to get, get this clarified. And we did have the council member who had not voted yet. And so to me, unless they state that they're abstaining yay or nay or whatever it is, then we don't, you know, we're not done voting. And so th that's my procedural ask right now is, is, do we take a roll call? Is Damon ready to vote? What's our next step here? And, and technically, I, I would I would I would rule that I missed the vote since the yeas and nays were taken. Uh, I'm simply asking. It's traditional for the chair to restate the motion. So, you know, a member makes a motion, goes on the floor, the chair states the motion, and then before the vote's taken, the, the motion is restated. And it just seemed like the motion got muddy. I was asking for a simple restatement of the motion. That's all. Understood, Damon. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Micah? Uh, I think Damon is correct in that he was requested a point of information since he was confused about the procedure and wanted clarification on what was occurring. And he has the right to do so, um, which could interrupt the vote and thus um, provide his answer. And then I'm not sure, Derek, maybe you're finding that faster than I am, if, if then we would have to reconsider or re-vote. But uh, Damien, you do have the authority to do what you have done based on point of information or parliamentary inquiry. 
I think they, so that's a good point, Mike. I think that I was kind of leaning towards maybe doing a, a closing the vote and doing a reconsideration, but because there wasn't a termination at, at ending the vote, it might be better just to continue to go to roll call uh, to, to clarify people's positions. And then, um, uh, and, and you all have gotten additional information about what you're actually voting on now, which, which may be helpful. If you want to change your, you obviously can change your vote too at, at any time before the vote closes out. Okay. Uh, that's my suggestion. I don't know if anybody has some objections to that. I, I like that, uh, yeah. Damon. I concur as well. Could the chair restate the motion? I'm going to have the maker of the motion do that. So, Chell, go ahead and restate the motion. Okay. The motion is to specifically authorize uh, the managing director to provide technical feedback, but not for or against type of feedback on bills to those involved in the legislative process about things that affect the council and the code implementation in the state of Washington. Okay. With that, we will go to a roll call. Shell Anderson? Yes. Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Bayreuther? Aye. Micah Chappelle? Yes. Damon Doyle? Yes. Uh, Roger Haringa? Yes. Matthew Hefner? Yes. Craig Holt? No. Peter Rickey? Yes. Katie Sheehan? Yes. And Corey Wilker? No. Uh, yes is passed. Nine to two. Nine to two. Okay, motion carries. And Todd, do you want to continue with the report? Sure, thank you. Okay, let's uh, move on. The, the last one, I, I believe we want to look at, uh, if you scroll down, Stoyan. Um, uh, did we go to 11.6 don't well uh, okay yes oh. it's a good point Stoyan. um because i cut you off because and last time was leaving so we didn't we didn't go in detail already yeah thank you um Stoyan, what when if you'd like to go ahead and uh, maybe so break this down please the the direction for the state building court council is to convene a work group and the work group to develop recommendations for the council uh, and the council to have sort of language that is still funny but, and, and uh, recommendations necessary for the council to adopt to apply the international residential court to multiplex housing and exempt multiplex housing from the international building court. These recommendations shall include those scope changes necessary to ensure public health and safety in multifamily housing under the International Residential Code. That's the direction. In uh, Section 2, 2 of this bill specifies that the work group shall provide its recommendations to the council in time for the council to adopt or amend rules or courts as necessary to implementation in 1995. This gets a little muddy because it says 1995. At the same time, further, it specifies that uh, the application date is December 1st, 2024. So this will require off cycle rule. Uh, I will go back to my previous comments, multiplex housing versus what was that one, middle housing. Uh, we have a few in a different views and uh, this bill defines the uh, multiplex uh, housing. So there, there are big differences uh, compared to what SPCC is doing currently. Uh, and the main concern here is that, you know, the council, again, this is from staff perspective. Uh, the main concern is that the council needs to uh, develop plans and approve, uh, and approve plans. And I, I, I will leave it there and I can provide more information if, if council members 
have uh, more specific questions. Okay, thank you, Stoyan. Uh, Craig. So mine's a pretty general question. I am, I'm, Stoyan, you did a great job. And I think by calling it muddy is an understatement. Can somebody tell me what they're trying to accomplish here, both this and the other middle house? Are they trying to create more low-income housing? What is the end game that they're trying to accomplish here? There's got to be a better pathway for it than what we're seeing here. But can somebody tell me what they're trying to accomplish? Micah, what, Micah and then Jay, please. Maybe Jay will have a better better answer. He should go first. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in as I'm hearing about this, wearing other hats as well. I would say the uh, HB 1110 on housing is talking about where more um, duplexes, triplexes, multiplexes uh, can go and requiring that those be allowed uh, in certain areas of cities, especially near transit. And then I think this bill and other bills are talking about for those multiplexes, uh, how much of the commercial building code should apply versus the residential building code to make those easier to build. So one of them puts them in more places. This is this the goal of this one is to make them easier to build. And if I can, uh... I think I, I made it worse uh, when I when I was trying to capture what they, exactly the bill requires us to do. But in in a, in a, in a short summary, uh, currently some of this how it's designed multiplex housing is uh, covered in the residential code, and most of this multiplex housing is covered in the building code. So this bill requires a work group to recommend uh, a proposal for the council and the intent as I read it is this multiplex housing to be regulated by the residential board. That's how I, that's how I read it. I get the, the intent is affordable housing, of course. Yeah. Micah, go ahead and then I have a comment also. Oh, where to begin on this bill? Um, again, this is the one I mentioned earlier where we <laughs> we had this proposal come through the 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 code change process and it was denied. Uh, this would take essentially apartment buildings, six unit apartment buildings, and there's there's other bills that go up to twelve unit apartment buildings and try to have those or have those built out of the one and two family residential code. Um, this came, and we've talked about this before, I think I mentioned this in previous council meetings, this came from a proposal out of the state of Tennessee, Shelby County, Memphis area, where the county went in and did a similar proposal and said, we're going to kind of eliminate having to go to the building code that requires your separations and, and specific means of egress that differ from one and two family dwellings and not have you meet those fire and life safety provisions out of the IBC for these multi unit structures. Um, what occurred there is that the state fire marshal came in and said, no, you cannot do this in, in the state of Tennessee and sent them it back over to the building code more or less for all these requirements as it is now. Um, so some folks picked up on this, promoted, pr proposed it to us. We turned this down already as a council, as the poll council. Uh, this bill brings it back in and more or less says create a work group to explore this. However, it goes beyond that. In section two, and I think Story might have mentioned this, it says once that work group is done, the SBCC shall adopt those rules and codes necessary to apply the IRC to the multiplex housing as defined by this legislation. It doesn't give you a choice to do, you know, if the work group says, hey, this isn't feasible, or here's some, you know, something that might work, it says you shall adopt it. The other thing this bill introduces is, is um, pre-approved middle housing plans. And it states in here again, that once a city or a county has these pre-approved plans, they cannot do anything more than an administrative review when they're submitted. Um, I, I'm gonna speak against, uh, you know, everybody goes, well, they're doing this in Seattle. Yes, they're doing this in Seattle as pre-approved accessory dwelling units, however, those still come in for individual review based on the geotechnical information, the, the seismic design foundations come in. It's, so it's not a, a blanket approval without 
any further review. And I think that would go beyond an administrative review that this bill indicates. So I, I, there's so much in here. Like I said, there's so many things unpacking this bill. I think the intent is good. And I think uh, Jay mentioned that it, yes, it's about affordable housing, but their way of getting affordable housing is actually providing lower construction fire and life safety standards for multi-unit apartment buildings that you normally get with one and two family dwellings out of the residential code. This goes against the whole historic premise of having a separate residential code um, and, and why they separate them in the first place. They're trying to, to, to you know, this is the, the level of risk that's acceptable in a one and two family dwelling structure compared to the risks that are inherent in multifamily, multi-unit structures um, with, with specific design criteria. Everybody goes, well, they got townhouses in the residential code. If you go to the townhouse section, the separations, they point you back to the separated, the wall separation design or construction requirements of the building code. So you're still not getting out of those mitigation measures that come from the building code. In other words, it's almost going to be a pointless work group to some extent. But that that's, you know, a lot of a lot of my own opinions in there. However, this bill has significant flaws, just like the original code language proposed hell had. It's not that we can't explore this as a work group. I think that was a good, good move on Representative Dewar's part in here um, when I spoke to them on this bill is that's a good thing to have. I'm like, you can go explore this, see what can and can't be done. However, to say it's got to be done and you have to adopt it uh, is, is just terrible legislation and is not what we should do as a council. And especially looking, you know, there, again, I think there's some other bills and maybe Stoney can correct me if I'm wrong that kind of tie into this whole pre-approved plans and having the SBCC look at those and approve those and say, yeah, these meet code, the residential code or something else. I, I, again, all of these are trying to tie together. Some of them have good intent. This has good intent. However, again, going about it with how they're doing it legislation, not the right path. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Thank you, Micah. Go ahead, Damon. Thank you. And, and Micah brings up uh, several good points in this. Um, that being said, is that uh, the legislature takes precedence over us. Uh, the legislators are elected by the people. Uh, we are appointed. If the legislature wants to throw something out and it gets voted and passed and signed by the governor, then that's what we're bound to do. So we can have opinions on all of these things, but I think that that's a, a waste of our time today. Um, I, I could certainly comment on every bill on here and several more. So I would like to just request that we you know, keep our discussion to procedure and things that do fall within our purview and uh, not, not the merits of the bill being discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Jay? Uh, just a point of clarification on Micah's um, uh, comments. Uh, the 1167 that we're talking about right now doesn't involve the pre-approved plans. It's a later bill that we'll be talking about, and we can see if that's, uh, you know, discuss whether that's something that's within our wheelhouse. Um, but uh, I think the discussion right now really needs to be from a code council standpoint. And I think Micah brought up some specific items that says what's being asked for in this bill um, is uh, has some conflicts and is suboptimal should be the things we focus on for 1167. Thank you, Jay. Um, Shell. Yeah, I, I agree with Damon that the legislature tells us what to do. Um, but I also agree with, with Micah and others that we should provide technical feedback on feasibility and other things as was discussed at length in the legislative committee yesterday. Yeah, Sean, and I'll jump in now and make my comments. I um, agree with everything you said so far. This is one where I, I would like the council to take a position on this to inform it, not, not based on um, the intent, maybe to Damon's point, um, but rather to help guide the most successful pathway um, of rulemaking. Um, so yes, the code council has authority granted by the power of the legislature. And that's where I would like to see this council advise 
on what the most successful rulemaking pathway could be to achieve the legislative intent. Um, and so in this one, I think we have a lot to say, and, and I really appreciate in, uh, in value in the legislative committee meeting where opinions are expressed because it helps us, helps us um, better understand the problem and define it. I learned a, a lot yesterday. I'm not as well versed in the IRC as I am in the IBC, and, and, and I gained a, a lot of knowledge that would inform, you know, what I, how, how I think we, we should um, advise the, uh, or inform is probably the right word, uh, the legislature on, on a successful uh, policy such as this. So um, now I don't know what the best pathway is. I would prefer to have a council meeting every week if we could, because then we would actually get the all, all of the input. I don't think that's uh, feasible. So I would like to, again, uh, have the council consider, especially on a bill like this, what what we want the legislative committee to do, and that would obviously help me as, as current chair. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, go ahead, Micah. Uh, I don't know where to go with it. I, I thought I kind of had a direction, but I, I agree with Jay that we should provide some some positive feedback again. And to Damon's point, I, you know, the intent of these bills are good. However, we are tasked as being the technical expertise experts to adopt the codes that are enforced in the state. And as technical expertise, we can sit here and say this overall, I don't know if it's even possible or feasible to meet the intent of providing affordable housing because you're still gonna go back to the more robust IBC. I just, I don't know how to provide guidance on this bill without just saying you can't, you know, overall get this bill done. So I, I that's why I'm struggling. Sorry, I was going to make a motion, but I, I don't know what that motion would be. I mean, I'm, I think we should be against this bill just based on all the technical criteria that's just not, you know, overall feasible, really. Um, but I don't know, you know, that I don't know if that's the right direction from the SBCC. Thank you, Micah. Roger. Um, trying to think about some positive uh, direction on how this bill could move forward. Um, I support the idea of, all right, we need to make it easier to have four and six, you know, four plexes and six plexes. That makes sense to me in our housing shortage. I, com I also completely understand with Micah, there's concerns about opening it up to just um, using the residential code, the, the you know, fire and life safety has to be, our life safety has to be the, the driving force for our, our code language. So the concerns that, I, you know, getting of this, of what's summarized there anyway, having a work group makes sense to me um, letting people know that it is probably almost writing a separate code, or you can use the IRC and you have to do A, B, C, D, E, and F in addition to the IRC or something like that. So it is a very complicated um, piece of code to try to implement. And I think to put a implementation date on it is makes that very difficult because it's very complex. So. I think, you know, some positive feedback is um, it, it, it would require a major code, uh, a section of code be written and approved. The timing doesn't make sense. You know, the timing is not achievable. Um, so again, I don't, I don't have a motion. That's my personal thoughts on where we're at after hearing everybody's comments. And um, so that's it. Thank you, Roger. Uh Katie, one one second. I want to check in with our our chair um, and get guidance on on our overall meeting. As as we're we're I think we're taking substantial time on this. Uh, what would you like to accomplish today? And and because we're we're getting into a kind of discussion, which I think is healthy, like we do in the legislative committee. But um, Tony, do you have advice? Yeah, I I don't know that I'm uh, seeing. I don't know that with council as a whole right now, we have a defined direction we're going in <laughs> as yep. far as this this conversation goes. Um, so 
I would recommend that if there are any motions on this subject that we take them now. And um, if it's a matter of further discussion, when's the next uh, legislative committee meeting? Uh, we've moved them to Thursdays at nine, but we're also prepared to react as needed. Okay. Um, I would recommend we move forward with any any motions that council members have, and um, we can continue to have discussions at the legislative committee meetings, which, um, I mean, anyone's able to go to. <laughs> so that might be a, a place where we can iron out some of that. Okay. That would be my recommendation. Thank you, Chair. And, 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 and again, I want to make sure everyone understands we don't meet again until March unless we have a special meeting. So we need to make sure we leave today with with um, direction to the legislative committee or and or the managing director. OK, thank you. So let's go. Katie Shell and Micah. Please. Can, can I, uh, I'm sorry, I just want to add here that there is a, a, a executive session scheduled for next week, uh, 26 Thursday at 8 o'clock. This is for uh, uh, 11, 11, 67. 8 o'clock, I'm sorry, not executive session. Let's see. Yes, executive session, 8 o'clock, uh, uh, January 26th for, for uh, 11 to 67. Thank you, sir. Katie. Um, I wasn't going to recommend this as a motion, but perhaps it could be one. It doesn't seem like we support this bill as written, but that we do support any effort to support um, multifamily and uh, multifamily housing and affordable housing. And so a work group that you know, any I, I would trust the legislative committee to come up with the right verbiage there, but to maybe for the legislative committee to discuss at your next meeting that ways that we could be involved in a work group sounds like, you know, so that would be the motion. And it, I mean, it sounds like Jay was talking about zoning. I mean, that's not under our purview. Um, you know, there's so many overlapping pieces of affordable housing that, you know, a, this directive is seems too specific at this point. So um, that would be my suggestion, if that makes sense. Thank you, Katie. Michelle. I agree with all the challenges of this bill and I strongly support, you know, Stan providing strong feedback to on this bill, but I don't think we should take a position on it. Okay, thank you, Sheldon. Micah, you have a motion. Uh, so I, I I know I've always, uh, today I feel like, and, and yesterday too in the legislative committee, I feel like I'm always in dissent on some of these things. I, I want to make a motion to uh, have the council go in opposition to this bill based on all the issues that, are, you know, that are, we brought up. Um, I don't think that the work group can meet the time frame. I think this is tied to another bill on pre-approved plans. I believe that um, the fiscal impact would be much greater based just on the work group and the level of involvement they would have to have uh, to extract data, create data, you know, um, review historical data on, I mean, we're talking about fire separation walls and all these other things that are not necessarily or not in the residential code. And now we're going to put those in the residential code. Um, again, I just, I think based on the complexities of this bill, the fiscal impact is significantly higher than uh, we have here on, on the list that Stoyan's kind of projected. And I just think there's so much in this that it, it's, it goes just a few steps beyond what the SBCC can handle. So my motion would be to oppose this bill as written with feedback that we would be more open to creating that work group to explore any options that we can, but without mandates for adoption. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And at this time we'll open it up for discussion. Um, 
quickly, let me just clarify something on the procedure and, and, and Robert's rule. And Derek, if you can help me out on this. Um, for, for Robert's rule, what's, what I'm seeing happening, and this has happened you know, for a while, is once we get on Zoom and we start a motion, it, it cannot be um, terribly clear at times, which is easy to do with the topics of discussion that, that are before us. Uh, as far as restating the motion, uh, generally Robert's rule requires that a motion be submitted to the chair in writing if it's complicated prior to the meeting. That's almost impossible to do with a lot of them. Now, that being said, that if a, if a complicated motion or one that is not clear or easily restated um, should be written down and sent to the chair to restate. And so that's why I ask the maker of the motion to repeat it. I don't see anything in Robert's rule that says that that is the proper way to do it. So I would like Derek's um, guidance on these motions and, and if that is okay um, to basically substitute me repeating the motion, which I find to be um, you know, not coming from me and not having it in writing beforehand are difficult to me to restate appropriately. So that's why I would like the maker of the motion to restate. Is that okay to do? Yeah, I, I, I have to confess, uh, I haven't advised on that before. I, ha I am familiar with the practice of this uh, committee. I don't know if it's a remote uh, Zoom issue or, or maybe a historical issue to, to not submit uh, motions prior to the meeting. Certainly, it's organic, and sometimes there's it's not possible to do that. There's nothing in Robert's Rules that requires motions, obviously, to be uh, submitted prior to the meeting. Uh, although I, I would note somebody mentioned earlier that motions the motions should be uh, in minutes should be clearly stated. Uh, and so there's a lot of utility, not just for our purposes, but for uh, staff and restating the motions when they uh, publish the minutes to ensure that there is clarity with the motions. Uh, I'm afraid, I don't know if I can, because I don't know off the top of my head whether Robert's Rules contains a specific requirement. I'd have to defer that and get back to you, Tony, but I do want to help you on that, make sure for future for future meetings, uh, make sure that's clear. I guess what I would say for purposes of this meeting, if people can state the motions with as much precision as possible, and, and potentially somebody on staff to write them down uh, to restate it uh, would be uh, help us all. Thank you, Dirk. Um, okay, we have a, a motion and a second. At this time, we'll open it up for discussion. Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the motion is in opposition to this, and I guess we're not meeting again potentially until the legislative session is over or, or nearly over. So I guess I, what guardrails or what parameters are within the motion that would allow us to support it if things are changed uh, in the bill itself? And that's a question to Micah. Um, I, I would, again, I like simplified, give direction for the work group. And that's it you know explore the options for this it's it's not like they have to tell us what to explore we know what they want to explore again and, and <laughs> this has been explored it was brought to the tags it went through our entire process and failed and now it's here at the legislation because they didn't like it being failed that's my opinion but i i don't understand you know why we would not be in opposition to this you already voted this down as a group unanimously if i remember correctly Okay, so just to, so that I understand, you're suggesting we, we oppose this bill, and unless we meet again as a council, we will continue to oppose the bill, regardless of changes made. Okay, that's... that's no, I, if, they, if they just create a work group, say create a work group to explore this, I would support that. But when they get into mandating adoption of the requirements and all these other things, and then limiting reviews on pre-approved plans. I mean, that this, this does mention pre-approved plans in section one. I, I It goes too far. I'm just saying that would be the only way I think my motion I would allow me to support it would be create the work group and do what you can. That's it. Okay, but the council is, if we approve this, we are <clears throat> opposing the bill until such time as we can meet again and cease to oppose it. Um, is my understanding, which means 
we would continue opposing it until March 17th at the earliest, regardless of whatever changes are made in it. And I guess that's that could be problematic if they make the changes that you're recommending right now, Micah. I think that should be a, an item that would be left up to the legislative committee to determine at that point. And then if they say, hey, they've changed this bill, maybe that goes out to the full council. Again, this is where not having enough at full council meetings during the legislative cycle creates a problem. Because what that essentially says is, hey, we shouldn't oppose any bill because they could change throughout the cycle and then we don't have an answer to, to modify our position. I, it's a problem. Sorry. Okay. I'll suggest that um, one modification to the motion could be to state two or three specific things that we oppose within the bill. And if those are removed, then we could potentially, then we would not oppose the bill because the problem is we're opposing it no matter what happens if we approve the motion as I understand it. I, if you're asking me to modify my motion, I don't have that answer. I would strike 98% of this bill Okay, um, I don't need to talk anymore. Sorry, give me one sec. Okay, all right, sorry, continue. Uh, Damon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to clarify, <clears throat> so this motion requests the council to take a position in opposition to the bill. I know that most of us are relatively new. Um, I mean, I've been testifying before this committee for 15 years. Can somebody, perhaps Krista, uh, let us know how often has the State Building Code Council taken a, an official position on a proposed piece of legislation? They have not done so frequently in the last six or seven years. Prior to that, they did it on a fairly regular basis. Okay, so this is not unprecedented. Okay, that was the clarification I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Todd, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I don't know that I support opposing a bill outright. I, I would rather find a pathway for the council, either as a whole council or to, again, give authority to the legislative committee and, and we can be more inclusive of, of anyone from the council to help inform, inform and make, um, and inform the rulemaking process to achieve whatever the legislative intent is. So I agree there is there are fundamental um, challenges by presupposing a solution in this, but I'd like to see us be have a positive contribution to inform that rather than taking a direct opposition to it. So thank you. Thank you. Jay? And I concur with the comments of Chell and Todd that I would like to find a path to say we would support under these conditions um, a flat out motion to oppose. Uh, I'm going to be voting against. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. So uh, you, guys, you guys know me, I'm opinionated and totally push back on stuff. I, I'm kind of surprised by some of the comments. You, you all have voted against this previously. And, and if you're talking about looking out for best interest in, in code development and code requirements, this is allowing multi-unit, multi-family housing 
to be exempt, explicitly exempt from the building code standards, meaning they're going to have lower fire and life safety standards than currently exist without substantiation. So for, for folks to sit here and go, we're looking out for the, you know, it's affordable housing. You're telling those folks for this affordable housing that their life matters less than somebody in a, in a other multifamily housing unit that has to meet the building code requirements. I'd, I'd find that a little shocking. So, and maybe that's going way beyond, but when you look at this today, multifamily housing on the IBC provides firewalls, fire barriers, it, it, you know, additional egress points, all these different items, even sprinkler systems that this bill will now say you cannot do. It explicitly states in, in section two, item one, multiplex housing, which is a new definition in this legislation, is exempt from the international building code. Even the work group, if they say, hey, we're going to point to the building code, you can't do it. Legislation says no. I, I, so sometimes I think that, yeah, we need to take a strong opposition to something, and this is one of those instances. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I would also add that in addition to fire and safety, accessibility requirements will probably be impacted. I don't think these new housing units will be built to standards which I could use. Uh, and so for many of the people who may want to be in this kind of housing, and I agree there's a need for it, I'm afraid that this will be exclusionary to people with disabilities. Thank you. Matthew? Is is this a binary situation? Does this have to be a yes or no uh, situation? Uh, is there any scenario in which we can uh, ask Ann to work on amending the bill to where it actually works for uh, the Building Code Council? It's my understanding, Micah, correct me if I'm wrong, that that is the intent is to say, you know, have the Building Council um, provide a work group that would allow us to to vet it through the codes instead of um, writing the code legislatively. And so I think that is the intent of of the motion from Micah. That is the overall intent, yes, is is to say, look, we I totally agree with the work group. I think there's a lot of options that can be explored through the residential code and the building code for for multifamily housing. However, this says, this provides limitations and exemptions and defeats the whole purpose of a work group of subject matter experts. That's my, that's my intent. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew, anything further? I think, well, I mean, if, if that's the intent that I don't think we have to ask for an official no position on the bill, we could, and would be able to sign in other and work amendments in the process. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Damon, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to echo what Matthew just said. It, it, the, actually, the motion, as it's stated, is a binary motion. It's a yay or nay. We support it or we do not. And I understand why we do not, but we need to take a position we're either supporting or we're not. So. Thank you. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, I think I can help bring this together because this is where I thought we left off with the legislative committee yesterday that um, I too, am, especially as chair of the building code tag, um, am, am opposed to you know presupposing that, it, that this needs to be in the residential code. I do believe it belongs in the IABC. Um, that said, I think there, I think there are ways that we can form a work group and 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 provide a pathway for rulemaking that then um, we were calling it you know IBC light yesterday, right? Or IBC with exceptions, right? I don't want to call it light because I you know again. Um, so I, I think we we understand the intent. Um, what I'm worried about is we take action as a whole council, which we only could do today again because we don't have another meeting, or we are limited to the extent of which Stoyan can represent us, and there's no there's not enough in between to inform and 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 uh, and work with the uh, the sponsors of the, of the bill of actual um, council members. Um, and whether that's in most appropriate in the legislative committee or in a full council, if so, I think we could have a whole council meeting next Monday on this and 
we should, if that's the pathway we need. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, further discussion on this? There is some public comment that is being requested. Thank you. Uh, Larry Andrews, go ahead. Not hearing all this, I mean, if you take the stringent IRC that has the sprinkler requirements in it and bring that into these buildings, maybe that would open up some of this that's that's making it harder to build these. So requiring sprinklers in these units and then lessening some of the other stuff that you've put in, maybe that would make the building costs a little bit less so so we can get some more affordable housing. I I I think there's merit here it, if the costs justify it. And but yet we still have safety and and maybe we tweak it so people with handicapped disabilities can use these units and and still make it affordable. I think that's I think that is important. And uh, but we've we've eliminated the sprinkler requirements, okay? But we bring the sprinkler requirements in, like the IRC says. Maybe those costs aren't as much as what we're doing, and and we need to see if 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 that would make it more affordable, because I've never heard of anybody dying in a building that's sprinklered. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Okay, uh, so I can go ahead. I, I wanna add, I, I mentioned that the, yesterday, the structural provisions. So it, it just directly moving, uh, again, really technical uh, uh, comment, moving directly uh, six apartments into the residential court. We have other provisions, the structural provisions uh, and uh, how it works currently, uh, the scoping, if a building exceeds the scoping in IRC, you have to use the International Building Code. So just uh, uh, automatically moving this uh, multiplex uh, uh, units or middle housing into the residential court uh, creates, other, creates other issues. So it's not only the sprinkler systems, it's uh, uh, accessibility, uh, seismic provisions, uh, structural provisions, what we do if if the building exceeds the uh, uh, scoping in uh, residential code, which most most likely it will. So this is all I want to add. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, okay, Micah, please restate your motion before we go to roll call. Motions to oppose. Okay, motion to oppose House Bill 1167. Okay. Yes, thank you. With that, let's go ahead and do a roll call. Chal Anderson? No. Jay Arnold? No. Uh, Bayreuther? No. Micah Chappelle? Yes. Damon Doyle? No. Robert Haringa? It's Roger, but oh, no. Sorry. sorry. That's a no. Uh, Matthew Hefner? No. Craig Holt? Yes. Peter Rickey? Yes. Katie Sheehan? No. And Corey Wilker. No. Motion fails eight to three. Okay. Uh, Jay, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to authorize the uh, council chair 
uh, legislative chair and managing director to provide in-person or written testimony on HB 1167 on uh, changes to give a work group flexibility to um, uh, develop code uh, for develop simplified code for six plant sixplex residences. <laughs> okay, we have a motion. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, discussion, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm just trying to get to uh, a place where we can authorize testimony to get to the point where a work group actually works and we can talk about some of the issues with the IBC and IRC that have come across in the discussion. Thank you, Jay. Micah? I, I, again, I'm not opposed to some positive spin, but I, but I don't agree with the motion. We're leaving it up to a few people um, to come up with some type of solution, and it would provide direction on something we've already done. I mean, we're flip-flopping here. This council voted against this proposal, and now just because it's in legislation, we're going, oh, maybe we should work with something. We've discussed the issues with the IRC and IBC and trying to get this done through a work group that was supported as decisions through the SBCC already. So, so yeah, you're flip-flopping a vote, but I understand that a work group could work. So I, I, so I'm not opposed to that. I'm just not opposed or I'm, I'm opposed to the way the motion is stated. Thanks. Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to, I will vote for this. Um, you know, really it is, I want to come up with a, a, a middle ground where it is easier to build um, four plexes and six plexes. So um, I think it's working. If anything, it would be working with the sponsor of this bill to get some middle ground so that the state council can create code language that would allow that. Okay. But I'll support it as it is right now. Thank you. Todd? Thank you, Chair. And I was just comment, Micah, I, I, I wouldn't present it as enabling individuals, the, the way we discussed it yesterday in the legislative committee was to have a voice for the council and or the legislative committee. And that especially means your voice especially on the committee and as the chair of the IRC takes. So I would, I would push that, that the intent is to bring everything you've said today and yesterday into that, into that uh, seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Craig? I like what uh, Jay is saying, and the reason I voted against the, to, to I voted with Mike on this is there's just not enough time in the oven to bake this cake in this legislative session. And if this the work, I really like the work group idea and simplifying the process to get more housing done. I like that, so I will probably I will support this. I, maybe some clarification from uh, Mr. Arnold to, uh, to help us understand that it's not going to get done, or the group. To, to, can advise the legislatures that it can't get done. This is too complicated to get done in this legislative session. And uh, I will support uh, the current proposal. Thank you. Uh, Jay, do you have anything you want to answer there or clarify? Other than the discussion on the legislative committee um, talked about both the prescriptive nature of the bill currently that we'd want to have flexibility and the timing of it uh, to have the right time to to, um, uh, to be able to have a work group be successful were two of the issues that we talked about. Thank you. Uh, Micah? Again, I'm not necessarily opposed to this, but the way it's worded is that we're going to create code. We already have code. It allows this type of construction. Allow, what you want to allow are breaks to those code because developers say the IBC is expensive to do this. You're right, it is. But there are reasons for that based on historical 
scientific data on fire and life safety standards that 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 have created the code where it is today. Um, so again, I'm not opposed to the work group and looking for something, but at the same time, I hear that the work group has to have success. I don't think that is what we should limit the work group. The, the work group may fail. They may come to the realization that there is not enough latitude or leeway in these provisions to allow this to be cheaper, to be different than what is already in the IBC. I mean, it is what it sounds like is, hey, we're going to bring over accessibility. We heard from public comment, we should bring over sprinklers. Well, are we going to allow 13R sprinklers or 13D? Are we going to have the full 13 system? Or are we going to allow a 2904, P2904 out of the residential code in these? I mean, you're going against a lot of data that doesn't have justification. And so to say that the work group has to have success in creating a code that already exists, but creating a new code to allow this, I, I, that's where I'm having a problem with the motion. Again, I'm not opposed to the work group, but what we're saying is we're going to take what the work group has to say and adopt it. Uh, I just, I, I, again, I, I don't, I understand everybody wants to stay positive. We want to, we want to look less a, as being negative towards something because we don't want to look like we're against affordable we're against affordable housing or something i'm not against affordable housing affordable housing can be constructed but exempting specific structures just based on a need without providing justification and saying we need to create something new that already exists i think is a bad precedent to set that's it thank you micah uh damon Mr. Chair, I just want to point out for the committee or the council rather that the uh, bill, the public hearing has come and gone that happened at eight o'clock yesterday morning. Uh, public comments are not yet posted on the legislative website. As uh, Stoyan pointed out, it's scheduled for executive session next Friday, which is uh, when the, the committee will vote on it. So the horse is out, already out of the barn here. Um, it's jumped to 14 co-sponsors. So, and, and mostly on the D side, and it is part of their primary legislative agenda for the year. So our only opportunity to intervene in this legislation will be when it goes to the Senate. So just, just an awareness of where the bill's at in progress. Thank you. Thank you for that information, Damon. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Um, yes, and I, I think because of that, this is where we've got to have the the flexibility to uh, be able to testify or to reach out to floor action on uh, on the House or if things go over to the Senate, uh, because I agree with Micah that the bill as written doesn't work, but the goal of this motion is to get things to a point where, where it can. Uh, Mike, I really appreciate all your passion on this issue, but I also would note that Seattle has done some exemptions um, for multiplex housing. And I think this is one, I, I think the intent of the legislature here is to look at some state standards with, that would do the same. Thanks. Go ahead, Micah. Sorry, Jay, can you tell us which ones those are? Um, you're talking about a single exit provision that's specific to buildings out of the IBC. So uh, if that's what you're talking to, that that is something different than this. And that that I don't think that needs to come into this item. That I, I use that as an example. Um, that's the one I'm aware of. You're the expert on this. But the point is on this that I think the intention of the legislature and the intention of them convening a work group is saying, what are those exceptions to the IBC that might move the needle for uh, affordable housing for a sixplex? Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, Jay, please restate your motion and then we'll take a roll call. The motion is to authorize the council chair, legislative chair, and managing director to provide in-person or written testimony uh, to enable a successful work group process for six-plex residential, uh, streamlined six-plex residential development. Thank you. With that, we'll do roll call. Shell Anderson? Yes. Jay Arnold? Yes. 
Todd Bayreuther. Aye. Micah Chappelle. No. Damon Doyle. No. Roger Hariga. Yes. Matthew Hepner. Yes. Craig Holt. Yes. Peter Ricky. Yes. Katie Sheehan. Yes. Corey Wilker. No. Motion carries eight to three. Okay, thank you. All right, anything further on the legislative committee report, Todd? Well, I, I defer to you, Chair, because we we were we have one more one more bill, but obviously at our pace, that's intrusive. So I look to you on schedule. We have twelve ninety eight that was discussed in great detail yesterday. Chair, do you want to do I don't know that, that we're going to have another opportunity. So let's go ahead and continue. Okay. And maybe we've streamlined as, as we practice here. Um, 1298. Um, uh, just real quick. Sorry, Todd. Chell, go ahead. I'm not sure if he has a. Yeah. Do we, do we need to extend the meeting? No, this is scheduled till four o'clock. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. Go ahead, Todd. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, so 1298 uh, started on the Senate side is 5258 and has moved over uh, to House, House Bill 1298. Um, this one, in brief, um, is dealing a lot with condos, but but it, it introducing, when you heard earlier, the pre-approved plan and so forth. If you scroll down a little bit, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at a different a different summary, Stoyan. Maybe maybe your longer list summary where you list up yes, the, the council members. I sent you a different summary, and I didn't want to post it because again, this is a working document that uh, <clears throat> when I post documents with uh, uh, analysis, uh, stakeholders and uh, members of the public consider this uh, a council opinion, which which is not the council opinion. It's just uh, a staff staff initial analysis that is really. Uh, something for the council to discuss. So what you have has a little bit more details than what we see here on the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to you then to maybe review the bill. Bill, please. So uh, section 13 is the only one that is related to the state building code council. There, there are other provisions that may or may not bring conflicts with the code, but 13 is important. Uh, it requires the council to adopt building and energy code provisions for multi-unit residential buildings between two and 12 units and three or fewer stories. So you see it's still uh, 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 multiplex housing but between two and 12 units. Uh, and uh, here is the important part, including approval of a variety of complete building designs and styles that are compatible in size and form with single family neighborhoods and capable of being constructed in common residential lot sizes. Uh, <clears throat> the code provisions and building design approved by the council will apply statewide. This is a language from the bill for statewide application and a local government may modify code provisions or building designs only to de decrease uh, design permitting or construction cost. So the initial uh, comment was that the requirement sounds like it exceeds the current council authority and obligation under RCW 1927 and 1927A. Uh, in, in a summary, the council is the policymaker and the council members and the council staff has no knowledge authority. Well, excuse me, I know some of you are very knowledgeable. And it's, a, it's a general statement. Uh, has no knowledge authority and obligation to prepare architectural and engineering plans, conduct plan checks and approvals, and uh, regulate uh, enforcement. So again, this is technical comment 
section 13 uh, goes to one size fits all approach uh, and uh, fiscal impact and policy and operational impact for the policy and operational impact it will, it will be a major impact based on the fact that we may need to uh, sign a contract with a third party to prepare these plans uh, we may need to sign a contract with a third party to review and, and uh, do the plan check on the plans uh, fiscal impact uh, may be major currently the bill is not clear enough to uh, for example how many types of buildings how many designs so it's still uh, unclear so this is why you don't have a number here but it will exceed 50,000 several times that's that's the brief summary of the bill with some initial comments again these are stuff comments based on the current uh, laws and regulations pertaining to the uh, uh, council of Okay, thank you, Stoyan, and, and I'll just give a very brief characterization of uh, of how I heard the conversation yesterday. I think there's recognition from the committee that of you know that is not what the state building code council does, and that probably is not the you know the pathway that would be advised. Um, but we understand the intent, um, and I would I would recommend that just like the last bill that we 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 uh, can. Um, provide input uh, to help them find a better pathway than, than what is proposed in the current policy. Thank you, Todd. Tony, can I jump in for one second? Please. I just, uh, uh, Todd said something that uh, confused me a little bit, so I just want to make sure that I'm clear. I looked at the, the status of this bill. Uh, the, the House Bill 1298 um, is a companion bill to the Senate bill that, that Todd mentioned. Uh, the Senate bill has is still in committee. They haven't had a, a meeting yet, uh, and is scheduled for a meeting. I think uh, on the twenty third. So, um, if if you test, if you have an opportunity to testify, if you if you're looking for an opportunity to testify here, depending on the outcome of of this motion, then uh, then there is still that opportunity in the Senate. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Chair, go ahead. Yeah. This, um, I am. I think we should actually op oppose this bill because specifically it requires that we approve plans and that's not a function that is anywhere near what the building code council is authorized to do. So I think this is one that clearly is, I think it's different than the last one in that we adopt codes and we look at codes and we have work groups. Okay we can do more of that approving plans is not something we do um and then it goes beyond that to do to suggest we do other things that we don't we don't do and are kind of far from what we actually do um so i would recommend i'm not going to make a motion at this point but i'm going to recommend that we that we actually do oppose this one thank you child damon yeah just a quick note I'm reading through the 39 pages of both bills uh this is primarily aimed at construction defect litigation. That's 90% of the content of the bills. Uh, I do agree that the portion, section 13, that references the council is asking us to do things that are quite frankly out of our purview, but uh, this is really a construction defect litigation uh, piece of legislation. Thanks. Thanks, Damon. Roger? Yeah, I would just, I mean, it sounds, I completely agree that we can't um, approve or design buildings, which is this, this is what it sounds like it, it's asking us to do. And I would just, as the structural engineer representative, it is impossible. If we were to design a, a structure that could be placed in any seismic zone in the state of Washington under any soil conditions in the state of Washington, it would not be cost effective. So to do one size fits all just is not a reasonable uh, approach for us to, um, you know, figure out a way to, to make it easier to build housing, so. Thank you, Roger. Pete? 
Yeah, I guess I, I have concerns over the very last sentence. Local government may modify code provisions only to decrease design permitting and construction costs. I would suggest that they will <laughs> modify code provisions. And essentially, uh, I'm afraid that this sentence guts uh, all code provisions whatsoever. It allows them to basically walk around anything they want to walk around. Uh, so uh, that that's very concerning to me. Thank you, Pete. Todd? All right, thank you. I want to speak to a specific point on this uh, section 13. Again, I, I agree, this is not the, right, the correct pathway, although I understand the intent and from the position of the manufacturing representative, uh, this type of approach, especially in Europe, which could maybe lead to more of a performance-based approach so that we have a target for um, maybe not static designs. I agree, I think Roger, you made that comment, but rather performance, you know, criteria that that we can now start to um, standardize, you know, some of our, our our approaches. That's that is especially relevant to manufacturing. So I would like to see us participate again. Um, but as written, no, it, it's it's not it's not good enough yet. Thank you. Thank you, Todd Jay. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to make a motion that the SBCC oppose. HB 1298 and Senate Bill 5258 until sections uh, requiring the SBCC uh, to uh, develop uh, and approve uh, plans are removed. I will second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, the motion is to oppose House Bill 1298 and Senate Bill 5258 until uh, SBC's, SBCC's direction to develop and approve plans is removed. Is that correct, Jay? Okay, thank you. And we'll open it up for discussion. Joe? Yeah, I'd also like the uh, portion that Pete alerted us to with the last sentence um but that is also removed as part of the motion i'm going to make a hopefully friendly amendment to jay's motion to oppose it until that sentence is removed sure i'm i'm fine with okay all right very well so the maker of the motion is okay with the modification and Cheryl, you were the second so we're good there micah go ahead I understand the motion is just to, to have them strike this section more or less, Jay. That'd be one solution. Okay. Um, I, and I want to support that. I, I think this is way beyond our scope, but again, this is tying back into the other bill with pre-approved plans type deal that would, you know, tell the enforcement division, which is tasked with enforcing the codes, that they can't do anything but an administrative review based on the last piece of legislation. Uh, I, you know, when all this ties together, it, it just puts together a bad package, but this is even worse because it tasked the SBCC with, <laughs> I mean, I know there's several on here that could do this level of work, maybe all of us, I don't know, but uh, that's way beyond our scope. So I'll support the motion. Thank you, Stoyan. Question question for Micah. Uh, so this bill, uh, I wasn't able to specify the fiscal impact because it's difficult. Uh, I asked designers how much it costs to design a building and they say, no, it's a secret. So I know Micah in Seattle, uh, they have these uh, pre-approved plans for ADUs. Micah mentioned, I can't remember one or two years. Can we, can we uh, specify uh, uh, money that went into this project? And we don't need to do it now, but I would need a little bit more information to be more specific in the fiscal impact, because again, this bill will bring major fiscal impact to uh, the council. I, I, it would be an astronomical number. I want to say there was there was at least a, a dozen or more various staff members from different department, mayor's office, all these other organizations that worked on getting some type of pre-approved plan in Seattle for 
accessory dwelling units. So you're probably talking, you know, well over a million, maybe several million um, to get something like this done. And again, it's not just a, a pre-approved plan. I mean, the, the structures and design is pre-approved, you know, the, the, the um, architectural design, but they still have to come in for site-specific standard, you know, or site-specific design or performance designs that are way outside the scope of the pre-approved plan because you can't, it's, I, I think somebody else mentioned it, you know, it would not be cost effective to provide a standardized plan across all um, seismic, wind, snow design categories in the state. So I, I, the number would be astronomical, Stoyan. But I would, I would not put less than a million dollars, if not more. Thank you, Micah. Uh, Roger, did that cover your point? I saw your hand up. No, I would say it's several million dollars. I mean, if you're going to design it for the snow load up at the pass, and I mean, it really is absurd to try to, to come up with a single design. And then the, my question is, is what, if the if the State Building Code Council hired somebody to design it, would we be the responsible party if something failed? Would we all get sued or would the, the State Building Code Council get sued? So it's just, it's just a very bad approach to, in my opinion. So I'm I'm... I will vote in favor of being opposed to this bill. Thank you, Roger. Chell? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and then just to provide Stoyan a bit more information, there are a few architectural firms that do that have some stock plans, but there it's required for those firms. Um, it's required for them to come back and modify it to the site specific conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, so, that, that's a required part of any sort of stock plan. So um, it, it's infeasible unless the architecture, the structural engineer, civil engineer, a few others come back and are hired to to modify it to be site specific. And, and that's not part of this bill. And it would, yeah, it, it means that, that the, the stock plans are not that much more cost effective than, um, than hiring a, a design team or, or choosing a stock plan out of a, a magazine or something like that. Thank you, Chell. Roger? Sorry, I didn't take my hand out. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, so the motion is to oppose House Bill 1298 and uh, Senate Bill 5258 uh, until the language is removed to have SBCC develop and approve plans and also to remove um, the last sentence noted here, which uh, states that the code provisions and building designs approved by the council will apply statewide and the local government may modify code provisions or building designs only to decrease design permitting or construction costs. And with that, we will do a roll call. Shell Anderson? Yes. Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Mayruther? No. Micah Chappelle? Yes. Damon Doyle? No. Roger Hiringa? Yes. Matthew Hefner? Yes. Craig Holt? No. Peter Ricky? Yes. Katie Sheehan? Uh, her mic's not working. She has yes, a... yes, okay. sorry, I panicked. Thanks. And Corey Wilker? No. And that oh. passes seven to um, four. Okay, motion carried. Okay, anything further, Todd? I with that I, I think we're I think we're good chair unless someone from the legislative committee advises I'm missing something okay Damon go ahead uh, if Todd determined that we're concluded I would uh, move for a 10 minute recess okay 10 minute recess that uh, starts now thank you uh Justin just quickly um it, it looks like
Katie is showing up as Matthew Hepburn as well, or Hepner, excuse me. Hi, um, I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of moving around, um, but I'm fine to be Matthew for now. <laughs> okay. So just, I, I don't know if everyone got the same link and it was under Matthews or what happened. We keep changing the names and they, and they. Corey? I just have a question. Did the did the council make Matt mad? He's using his low vault people to change names. Or... Say that again, Corey. I'm sorry. Did 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 the council make Matt Hepner mad? And he's using his low vault people to to change people's names. There we go. <laughs> he's he's tri tri tripling his vote. Uh, or does that only count as one vote? Right. <laughs> It, it seems Matthew is very popular today. Yes. I'm I'm everywhere. <laughs> we have a quorum of Matthews. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's uh, call the meeting back to order and we will start with a roll call. All righty. Chell Anderson. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Mayruther. Here. Oh, hang on. Uh, Mike and Chappelle. Present. Damon Doyle. Here. Roger Haringa. Here. Matthew Hefner. Here. The real Matthew Hefner. Uh, Craig Holt. Here. Peter Ricky. Here. Katie Sheehan. Here. Corey Wilker. Here. And one more for Chell Anderson. Okay, we will continue. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and go to agenda item number 10, which is ongoing off cycle rules. And I believe, Ms. Goyan, you wanted to say something about this as far as the council action. For the ongoing off cycle rules, uh, you see the X uh, for council action. The council action is not needed. We hit the X just in case. What we are trying to do here is just give you some more information pertaining to this uh, off cycle rules that you made me happy doing. So uh, uh, each one of us is working on a different off cycle rules. So uh, we, we will provide some uh, information for the council to. Uh, information purposes. So again, no vote is needed until, unless the council decides otherwise. Okay, thank you. And I guess I'll lead off. Uh, I've been working on uh, modifying the definition of the child care or in-home ch family child care, uh, the definition in the IBC and IRC. Um, one of the first things that I'd like to point out is that it's already modified from the model code language from a, a limit of five up to 12 um, children in a um, home setting. Um, I've been working with the DCYF, which is the Department of uh, Child, Youth, and Family, um, to uh, propose some code language to potentially modify this. They're interested in increasing this uh, up to a 18 um, children in a single family um, uh, situation. And uh, they have, we've been working with some folks and uh, we have some proposals. They, they'll wanna call it building code light. We, uh, I laughed earlier in the um, meeting today when we had the same type of uh, um, euphemism uh, mentioned, but uh, we haven't come to anything that's uh, super concrete on that one, just that they desire to move to 18 children um, and possibly in the future to increase it even more, but 18 is the target right now. And um, they're talking about increasing some of the stuff that's already included in the provisions in the IRC to uh, mimic more some of those I-4 or E occupancies in the building code. And uh, we're still working on some of that to bring to you guys um, for your perusal. Okay, thank you. So if, uh, if there are council members with questions, feel free to ask 
questions. If, if not, I can continue with that for. Okay, Micah, go ahead. So, Dustin, are, are there documents that show the modified definitions that you all are working on? And how extensive is that? Is it just definitions? Or are we going into other requirements in the code for that family child, family home child care? And then, yeah, we'll start there. So it would, the definition would be a fairly minor modification, but it, but it means a lot, changing the number from 12 to 18. Um, as far as other sections of the code that would be impacted, it would be, um, the, I believe it's section 323 in the um, IRC, where we have the uh, already existing modifications for um, in-home child care, where pretty much from zero to six children doesn't really require any modification to a structure. Uh, from six to 12, there are some provisions in there that require uh, the occupants of that structure to uh, make sure that certain uh, criteria are met for them to be allowed to uh, have the more children in there. And we don't have any specific code proposal on that yet. Um, I've got an email from the uh, work group today uh, with um, supposedly something in it, but I have not had a chance to review it. And, um, you know, uh, one other thing that, you know, I don't necessarily think it, impacts what we do very much, but they, in the licensing portion of this, this is where it kind of is stemming from is the DCYF and their RCW had a um, change that allowed them to issue waivers to the maximum limit in uh, home ch family child care. And they also have some uh, requirements for personnel and staffing of these facilities um, but, you know, for example, right now they've issued a waiver. I don't remember exactly what city. I believe there's uh, 34 children in one of these houses. 35. 35. Um, and so it's a gross, uh, in my opinion, overextension of, you know, letting somebody have a waiver for having a, you know, child care facility or more of a commercial nature in a residential. And, you know, we've had some building code concerns, we've had the licensing concerns, and then there's also some zoning concerns as well. You know, if these are going into neighborhoods where, you know, you expect to have lower vehicle traffic and you've got 35 drop-offs and pickups each day, you know, even if they carpool, it's still quite a bit going into those neighborhoods. So we've been trying to discuss all that and come up with something that is sort of attractive, but it's not getting a lot of traction at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, and then you said we're moving into the R4 information. The R4 information, it's not much to say. We, we, uh, we're coordinating with the Department of Health. Uh, we are uh, still discussing the work group. We have some ideas and we have some candidates for the work group. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we will coordinate with the Department of Health and we'll start with a, a simple proposal. And it's not only R4. Uh, there are many other sections that we need to take into consideration because the adoption of R4 only, as far as I understand it, again, I'm not a technical expert here, but as far as I understand it, the adoption of R4 only will create other issues with this licensing facility. So uh, we are in a process of moving up, but we started uh, a little later than uh, uh, a distance uh, child care uh, performance, so we, we need to catch up with that. Okay. Uh, also, uh, I, I think I mentioned that there is a bill that requires the council to adopt R4. I don't know how it will help currently, again, since we are already working on it, but uh, it's not a simple task, uh, uh, you know, coordinating the language, coordinating with uh, 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 existing provisions in Washington administrative code. Uh, evaluating different different licensing facilities, so it will take a little time. Okay. Um, so, sorry to go. Uh, now I'll come back to R four in a minute. And I had a, another quick question on the the family home child care. It, um, is it just SBCC staff that are attending those meetings, or do we have an actual council member that's on that work group as well? 
Just we, SBCC staff. And this is the staff. We don't have a council member. And the idea is this work group will end up with the language and then we will involve, we will start the regular process through the technical advisory groups and the, the, the standing committees and concerns. So that language that comes from that work group, even with the involvement of DCYF, is not set in stone. You you would still have to go through the entire public process, and it could be determined that that is, you know, exceeding anything, you know, beyond what we are, what either the entire council is comfortable with. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Excellent. And then back to the R four. If that legislation passes, that would essentially make the work group for R4 and all the other things that go along with it uh, an irrelevant scope of work. Is that what if I'm hearing? It, if it passes, it requires, uh, it's a very simple requirement. It requires the council to adopt R4. And uh, we can do okay. it. It just, that, yeah, that's on. Based on my discussion with DOH and, and uh, reading some documents, and uh, uh, there were similar issues introduced before my time. And, uh, you know, I get the impression that it's not a simple task. Uh, in 2017, sure. uh, the council established a, a work group, for, uh, uh, and uh, the council uh, sent a few letters to the legislature and, and legislators. Uh, and the recommendation was it's not for emergency rule, there need, needs to be more work done. The expectation was a proposal will be submitted. Nothing was submitted in 2018, nothing was submitted in 2021. Uh, so I hope we, we will do a better job and we'll, we'll be able to uh, end up with a proposal that will be adopted by the council. But again, that's the first step. Uh, we intentionally didn't want to involve the council at the beginning. We need to start with a simple language that we can build on. So it, it's almost unfortunate we didn't bring that piece of legislation more to the forefront of our discussion at this meeting on our legislative committee report, because it sounds like that we have extended outreach to explore these options and they weren't happy with our opinion voted at the last council meeting that said they could use R4 as an alternate or modified code method. And now they're gonna force us to go that route through legislation that, that's just an unfortunate process um, since we are trying to work with them. And it's not that we don't wanna have that, we just wanna make sure it is robust and captures all the other sections of code. Oh, well, um, thank you for the input and information. To, to the best of my knowledge, there are already uh, projects that are using R4 currently that are using the council opinion and are for offensive, but I, uh, again, that's just, uh, I don't know how reliable my information is. Sure, thanks, Stoyan. Uh, I'm, I'm just not sure how to take some of these items. It seems like if, if work groups or folks aren't getting what they want through the tag process or other process, that they're just gonna go around us to the legislature and, and I'm not sure how that's a, a, a beneficial mutual working relationship when uh, I think we're doing our work and duties in, in good faith, so. Uh, regarding the, this R4 uh, bill, uh, we uh, reached out to the uh, uh, sponsors, at least one of them, and we, we delivered similar, similar information. We are working on it. There are other issues with R4 only, so we, we wanna do a, a, a comprehensive evaluation, if I can say that, evaluating different licensed care facilities. Again, I'm not the technical expert here, but trying to uh, improvise uh, and uh, uh, paraphrase my uh, discussions with DOH. Um, so I hope the, with the work group and the off cycle process, we may be able to do a better job. Okay, Stoyan, do you have um, an update on, do you have anything further on the R4? Uh, uh, I didn't hear it. Do you have anything further on the R4? No, no, I don't, I don't. Okay, do you want to move to the uh, electrical code, residential? Krista? The energy code? The energy code, yeah. yes. So, um, 
So far, staff has worked on some editorial corrections to the original proposal or the revised proposal from the proponent. I apologize, Krista. Sorry. Damon, I don't want to bypass you if you have something to say about the R4. Go ahead. No, I did not. I was uh, being proactive and getting ready to speak on the current bullet item. <laughs> okay. I would oh. re really like to hear what Krista has to say first. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Krista. Uh, so staff has worked on some editorial corrections to the proposal that uh, this work group will be based on, and I will be working with Damon to establish the work group for it. Um, so Damon, take it from there. Okay, thank you, Krista. Um, if I may share my screen for a moment. Okay, bear with me. Here we go. Screen two and share. Okay, I can't see confirmation that people are seeing it. Uh, it should be a Word document. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, it's, it's on the screen. Okay, so I've been out uh, beating the bushes and uh, uh, trying to recruit here. Um, I've got to hand it to uh, Chell for doing the same. Uh, he, he got... I received emails from Shell that Dave Balin and Greg Davenport were both interested. I've spoken to Dan Wildenhouse, uh, clearly Jonathan Jones from WSU, um, being uh, the the proponent of the uh, the amendment that was submitted. Uh, Andrea Smith from BIW has reached out, and Judson Willis uh, from Cardinal Financial. They specialize in EEM, which is energy efficient mortgages, and of course with the new. Uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, tax credits that are available that makes this having an ERA path much more uh, uh, important for the state of Washington. Uh, you'll see three other names on the list that have not gotten back to me. Uh, one is Steve Tapio, New Condition Homes. They specialize in uh, high performance homes that are all Energy Star and HERS rated. Uh, I'd love to have Luke Howard on board. I've worked with Luke for over a decade. And then, of course, Michael Lubliner is, you know, the grandfather of all of this. Uh, it's all a matter of if Oak Ridge will allow him to spend some time on this. As far as the timeline goes, um, I kind of laid out briefly what I thought would it would take to uh, uh, complete the objective of this work group. And I, and I don't know what is more appropriate nomenclature, work group or task force. Uh, what, do we what do we tend to fall on here, Krista? Uh, we kind of have used both of them in the past. We could call it a workforce or a group task. Um, <laughs> I'll go with both, <laughs> work group task force. So I would like to have our first meeting within the next 30 days, uh, review the document that you guys have edited, um, staff, and then possibly have a follow-up meeting a couple weeks later if there's any, um, you know, any back and forth on that and, and put together a final draft proposal to bring back to the council. I noted that there is a, a, a committee meeting on the 10th, or excuse me, the MVE meeting. I, if we do have that meeting, then that would be the appropriate place to start first, followed by the full, full council at our next meeting in March. Um, if there are things that need to be changed, we would have a third work group meeting and then come to the council once again, uh, following the MVE co uh, committee. The one thing being a, an off cycle rule, I don't know what the timeline is for public comment. If it's 30 days, 60 days, uh, Stoyan, I was gonna rely on you to, to give me feedback on that with the objective, if at all possible, to have this passed and ready to implement by July 1. Now that's, that's the best case scenario. If it happens a month or two after that, it's not the end of the world, uh, but the, all of the tax credits are in place now now they are available to, to 2030. So, uh, but again, if we could roll this ERI code compliance method out with the new code, I think that would be an awesome accomplishment by this council. So those are my, uh, my thoughts on how to go forward. Uh, if anybody has any feedback or questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you, Damon. Uh, Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Damon, for taking on this, this effort, um, and congratulations on the progress so far. Um, I'm going to ask, a, I'm going to carefully ask a general question with no um, judgment on, on this, this particular effort. If we're going through this um, 
let's call it tag and work group reform either by mandate in the RCW or is that what I'm hearing through Stoyan is perhaps we will just voluntarily, you know, update our wax, you know, as, as, as we um, within our rules and so forth. Should we later have a discussion about appropriateness on our tags and our work groups of having registered lobbyists perhaps? Um, I'm not trying to open up anything ex except a, a, where that discussion should be should be had to align with with what um, we're being asked. So thank you. Todd, I think that's a great question. And looking at this particular list, um, the only one that might come close to being a lobbyist would be Andrea. Uh, however, she is not a lobbyist, not a registered lobbyist. She happens to work for a trade association that employs lobbyists. Um, but I do not see anybody on this list that I'm aware is a registered lobbyist, if that helps answer your question. Yeah, and again, it wasn't directed necessarily at this list, but raising the question. So thank you, Damon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Micah. Thanks, Damon. I'm always acronym deficient. Can you remind me what EIR uh, work group is and, and what rules you're working on? Gotcha. So currently we have two and a half, I'll call it. We have three, three really compliance methods in, to, in order to comply with the Washington State Energy Code. We've of course got the prescriptive path, which is what you know 98% of people utilize. We do have a performance method that's existed in the code since 09. Uh, the problem with the, the performance method that's in there as written is as you increase the efficiency of your target home, you also increase the efficiency of your base home. So it's never worked. Gary Nardine and I had multiple conversations over it. This is taking the ERI, which exists as chapter 406 in the IECC and moving it over to our Washington State Energy Code. So ERI is Energy Rating Index. Um, essentially, it's a HERS number to hit compliance. So I believe right now, and I'm probably going to misspeak, but uh, I think right now in the IECC for Climate Zone 4 and 5, you need a, a HERS score of 54 or better. The HERS rating index has been around since 2006. It, it's supplied by ResNet. It's also a part of, um, uh, I'm, now I'm losing my own acronyms here. Um, Is it, I believe it's ASHRAE 90.1. Um, so a, a home that complied with the 2006 IECC would have scored a 100. And a, a home that produces as much energy as it uses or a net zero energy home scores a zero. Uh, with that HER score, I've been in projects that you know, range from the 60s for a, a average built code home all the way down to homes that have scored a minus 23 on the on the HERS index because they produce way much more power than they use. So what this gives us is, is a compliance path. And I, mentioned, I mentioned a third. So we have prescriptive. We have an odd performance method that no one uses. And then we also have uh, passive house. So if you're passive house certified, you're deemed code compliant and don't have to go through table 406 or any of the other things here. You simply, if you're passive house compliant, you're, you, you pass. What this gives us, if we adopt an ERI number, it says if you hit this particular energy rating index, uh, the HERS rating being the predominant one that's out there, then uh, you are deemed qualified. And I noted in a previous meeting that in California, um, the, where everybody used to be performance, or excuse me, prescriptive based, once they went to net zero, that over 90% of builders comply by using the energy rating index or the performance method. So there, there's my acronym, energy rating index. Um, I don't think there's any others I stuck in there other than MVE and, and EEM. And I think you know what those are. So does that answer your No problem. It, it does. Thank you very much for going into such depth. And it sounds like you're gonna be creating some rules um, uh, or at least some process that would have to be reviewed and approved or inspected to you by a jurisdiction. Um, is that true? Would that be a true statement? 
Um, I don't believe so. I, I think what we're creating is we're, we're you know using the IECC as our model, as our base code, correct? Just as, as we do the IRC and the IBC and so on. Um, this would be the Washington State modified version of of chapter 406 that exists in the IECC. Now we've we've taken that chapter number and assigned it to something else. So we'd have a numbering issue. That was one of the reasons that uh, the proposal I've submitted got hung up is because we had duplicate numbers. So we would be adopting that chapter of the IECC with Washington amendments. So I guess my question is, is there would be enforcement of that if you submitted this to a building department that is correct. So uh, in order to get, in order to achieve a HER score, it being again, the predominant way of complying with the ERI, uh, you have to use an accredited HERS rater. Uh, I believe all those provisions were within the submittal. Um, uh, one thing to note about HERS ratings is that to be a HERS rater, you know, not only is there a sense about a training and testing to uh, qualify for that, uh, there is a a QA component of 10%. So one in every 10 homes that a rater does, uh, the program comes out and does a verification. So they're uh, basically the, the builder or the applicant would submit a, her, a preliminary HERS report uh, upon you know submittal of their plans. And then before a certificate of occupancy, they would submit a final HERS report that is certified as deemed complied. And that requires two field inspections by the rater um, to confirm everything that they used in the modeling actually occurred. Awesome. Thanks for all that information. Um, can I request then that you add a jurisdictional representative on your work group? That way it would maybe mitigate issues that could come up on this side of the counter um, with the middle of these documents or implementation of rules that you come up with. Absolutely. Did I just hear you volunteer? No, not one bit. <laughs> However, um, I'm going to say I, I could either ask um, my energy policy developer, Dwayne Johnlin, to maybe provide a name. I'm not volunteering his time because he doesn't have enough of it right now. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe provide somebody that uh, might be beneficial for that work group. And so Certainly. thank you. I've, I've worked with Dwayne in the past. I would love, I mean, if Dwayne was willing to come on board, that'd be awesome. Um, I also, uh, I have some local uh, building officials here. Um, John Ness, protege, uh, uh, would be a, a, a great guy. Wade, uh, Wade Duffy would be a great guy to have on board as well. So, Yeah, if you've got somebody in mind that would be beneficial from, from the enforcement side, but that'd be great. Um, yeah, like I was saying, I'm, I'm not going to volunteer Dwayne's time. Uh, considering I'm his supervisor, I want to prove it because he has to finish Seattle's energy code before. <laughs> uh, the end of April as well. So <laughs> not going to happen. Sorry. Yeah. But thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ch Chell, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to give a little context as well, adding to what Damon said. Thanks, Damon, for getting this going. Um, this would be a new compliance method for Washington. Um, uh, it was approved or was submitted, a proposal was submitted to the tag, the energy code tag, and it was not approved, but there were some technical issues with the way this middle was prepared, as Damon mentioned, uh, numbering of things and, so, and some other things as well. And kind of the other reason was there was not a HERS score that was commensurate with the rest of the Washington State Energy Residential Code, and that would be one uh, of, of what I would hope the group would do would be come up with a a HERS score that would be that would align with the rest of the Washington State Energy Code and include some mandatory measures from the rest of the Washington State Energy Code residential um, so that it's in line with that. Um, and then, yeah, I think the reason, one of the reasons why this is coming back to light is the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act which now gives 2,500 to 5,000 per per home that gets this and in, in the interest of reducing the cost of housing, that, that's real money um, that will go to, uh, you know, defray the cost of, of home ownership uh, for new homes in Washington. So we're so I'm in, in support of this task group or workforce or whatever it is. <laughs> Thanks. 
And Chell, I really appreciate your support and help in this in this endeavor. Um, I, I, if I recall correctly, I think this this uh, measure uh, failed by one vote. So there there was a wide support with it. I think it just simply needs to be cleaned up. And absolutely, we need to make sure that it is commensurate with with the with our latest version of the energy code, and that. Uh, it's a it's an apples for apples. This, this is something we've been well. I personally have been working on since two thousand nine. Uh, Chuck Murray, you know, would tell me every code cycle it'll be this cycle, it'll be this cycle, and you know, here we are five cycles later. So hopefully, this is the one. If I, if I have one accomplishment as a member of this council, and this was it, I'd be ecstatic. Okay. Thank you. Anything further, Chuck? Okay. Excellent. Um... Anything else on the um, energy code? Go ahead, Katie. <laughs> I was calling you Matthew because <laughs> I was looking at the name. Sorry, go ahead. Um, that's okay, like I said. Um, is it okay if we join as um, council members? Like, could we join in on the meetings if we can? Or is it is it, are those open meetings? Like, how is that gonna work? No, we have a we have this cigar room at this this joint. You have to have a certain knock to get in the door, and, and no, I, by all means, I I would take all all of the input that uh, that we could have. I would invite all council members and and you know the, the public for that matter to uh, uh, participate and weigh in. Great, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Anything further? Uh, let's go to. Oh, I had it up. Hold on. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, we have public comment uh, from David Babylon. David Babylon? Balon, sorry. David, go ahead. I'll need to unmute. David, the floor is yours. Go ahead and uh, turn your microphone on. Okay, we'll go to Larry Andrews and then we'll come back to David. Yeah, I submitted in the fall on table C407.3 bracket one, bracket one, that there was flaws in the table. And I was wondering if the table's been corrected yet. I haven't seen the table been corrected, but there's definitely flaws in it. And I brought that to your attention. I kind of want to know where we're at on that. And because uh, I, I gave written documentation of the problems. And uh, so you've had three or four months right now to, to take care of that. And uh, I'll go ahead. So what Larry submitted, I believe, um, was that the propane emissions number in the table was incorrect. Is that correct, Larry? That's correct. And and the oil yeah. table is incorrect. Okay. And I remember Caroline was looking at that, and I think generally agreed with Larry's viewpoint. Um, I don't. I, I trust Caroline and, and Larry, so it's probably, yeah, it's probably some numbers would need to be changed. I don't know what the right remedy for that is, if it's editorial or if somehow it's, it requires more staff time to, uh, to submit a, some kind of a rule change. Uh, if it's editorial, we can do it through uh, expedite rulemaking, uh, but I, I don't know if it's editorial or not. Christopher, no, mm -hmm. yeah. So we need to evaluate that. And uh, we, we we are planning. Well, if we can complete our law cycles, we may have a little time to do this uh, expedite rules that will fix some editorial uh, uh, issues in the code. It's not only the energy code. So this particular table, we, we need to evaluate for it. Uh, Larry, would, would you be able to um, 
send uh, staff the, an email or something that just kind of brings us back to the forefront so that can be examined and then staff can disperse that to council as they see fit and we'll we'll try and take care of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll submit it to Stolen. Okay. He, he sent me the table. I, I saved it in the uh, web page that the council members can review. I, I guess it's my fault. I missed the, uh, I didn't understand what is, didn't understand that we needed to do further work. So I'll, okay. uh, I'll resubmit. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Very bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Let's try David again. David, you've been promoted to a panelist that should allow you to turn your microphone on. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead and conclude agenda item number 10, and we're gonna go ahead and jump to agenda oh, item. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Um... I was promoted to a panelist. This is Gavin Tenold. Uh, I had my hand raised. Oh, I my you're... apologies. I missed it. My apologies, Gavin. Go ahead. Floor is yours. Yeah. yeah, and and um, I don't want to speak for David. Um, I sure hope he can get on the line here. But um, I was on the tag uh, that discussed the HERS uh, proposal from um, Jonathan Jones and um, I want to just uh, you know, kind of go on the record here to say that I have heard um, the the home builders representative here state that uh, the HERS proposal was voted down only because of uh, lettering and numbering issues of the proposal itself. And um, in my opinion, and I was the mayor of the motion to um, vote to disapprove, uh, that, that is not true. Um, we had issues with, as Shell indicated, the uh, HERS modeling itself. We had questions concerning the regulation of HERS raters. Uh, passive House continues to be brought up as an example of a, a pathway that works. And uh, Passive House, as this council has decided, will unequivocally always pass. HERS houses will not. And um, I just wanted to get on here and make sure that that was stated. And uh, I do hope that um, this work group is successful. I, you know, being in the solar industry, we see the IRA is a great tool and we, we want to see that get used too. But um, this first pathway is not passive house. Um, and uh, that was not why we. Uh, the, 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 I'm having a hard time getting my words out. The, uh, the statement is not true that that was the only reason that we voted it down. So, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Gavin. So, is it possible for you to hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. And uh, oh, good. the floor is yours. Just keep in mind that uh, um, to not be repetitive in nature from the previous public comments. Go ahead. Um, I, I, dis I don't disagree with anything that's been said that's been said about the actual meeting uh, the, and the tag uh, the tag review. Uh, that said, the the principal uh, issue in my mind was the fact that we did not get on the tag a consistent um, a consistent rating point, and nor did we get any rep any representation of how that rating point how whatever rating point was presented related to our actual code. The, it is a key feature of uh, the ERI that it's an actual uh, performance run, and it's a key feature of our code that we have actual performance goals. So what, need, what will need to happen, and I believe um, at least Nia has said that they would support it if, they, if it becomes clear what they can do, is that one or another of the members of the committee, and I, there's two people on it that could do this, would do comparisons between um, between the ERI and its its essential requirements and the Washington Code. The second point is we have things in our code 
that are, don't exist in IACC, at least they don't exist now. Uh, and they would need to be like separate restrictions on what finally happened given a complying ERI um, for, for essentially for presentation at the counter. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, it, it's maybe a high bar and it maybe isn't, but it needs to be uh, noted that it's not just a simple ERI that we're going to get. Thank you, David. Andrea Smith, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the two comments that were just made. Um, I believe this is exactly why we created the work group so that we could run some of the simulations and models so that we could determine whether or not the ERI that index rating that is listed within the IECC and the requirements that go along with that actually equals the amount of energy savings that each credit does. So um, very excited to be part of this, um, you know, initiative running forward and, um, you know, if anybody on the SBCC or anybody in the public that has um, any comments, concerns, feel free to reach out to me as one of the people participating in this. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Poppy Storm, go ahead. Hi, yeah. I just wanted to um, add that I think that it would be very important to do that analysis and that I don't think that this schedule actually accounts for that. So that's one of the biggest concerns. And it was a similar issue when we were debating this in the TAG and I participated in that process is that the analysis had not been done, even though there had been a long lead time moving up to that. And it wasn't at a level that we could determine that there was equivalence. And so um, I think that it's very important that this process, and I agree that it would be great to do that analysis and have this process, but if there's again, not enough time and potentially not funding to do it effectively, we are potentially opening up a giant loophole in our code. And I definitely think this is a, a very uh, important thing to look at closely and not just assume that this is a, um, a an issue with uh, the, the way that the the um, uh, proposal had been copied over from IECC. Thank you, Poppy. Okay, um, that concludes agenda item number uh, 10, we will be going to agenda item number 11, establishing the following work groups. I, I, I know I surprised many council members with that, but what I'm asking for, I, I think we all agree that there are some conflicts between our policies and procedures in the bylaws and there one the, the unclear language and, and other stuff that, uh, needs to be uh, fixed or modified. So I didn't want to do it by myself. I have some ideas what I want to do, but this shouldn't be what Stoan wants. It should be for the benefit of the council. And uh, what I want to do here and what I'm asking for, uh, five council members, uh, I coordinated, I discussed this with our assistant attorney general, so he will help on this. Um, very informal work group that I will share my ideas and we all will share our ideas and we, uh, my wishes will end up with some basic language that we can uh, uh, craft and then start the process with the uh, full council with the standing committees. Uh, I can, I can, I don't want to get into details and, and I don't want to uh, provide comments comments related to whether or not something needs to be changed, but I, I, I will just make a few, uh, a few points. So you see uh, in the agenda TAC composition. So how we create the TAC groups? Do we need nine technical advisory groups or we can do a better job with three? Uh, who is attending? Who is the TAC member? how we deal with the conflict of interest, how much changes the technical advisory group members can make to the initial proposal. Uh, and and, and, and I, I'll go a little further on that. We have an initial proposal with 
cost benefit analysis. The cost benefit analysis is a good example. And then it get drastically changed. And the only common thing with the initial proposal is the section number. If this is the case, then who is developing the cost benefit analysis? Because the staff currently has no capability of doing that. Uh, the technical advisory groups are not providing complete uh, a cost benefit analysis. So this is just one thing that I'm using as an example, but I want to evaluate all this. Uh, as somebody mentioned the, the lobbyist. Can a lobbyist be a TAC member? Uh, um, do we care about registered lobbyists or, or any lobbyists working for different organizations? So, you know, those are the things that I want to put on the table for discussion. Again, this regard that I'm proposing this, it's not for me, it's for the council. Uh, the uh, other other things, uh, the court adoption cycle, that's very important. So we are saying we have we have a three-year court adoption, triennial court adoption cycle. And I wanna share my screen and, and show you something. Can you can I let me share? So what you see here is how many filings with the court revisor's office we have between January 2021 and December 2022. Okay, see, see like that? I, I counted 87, 87 filings, uh, 18 emergencies, and I don't know how many of cycles. So I'm not, I don't want to, well, you know me, I don't like the off cycle rules for many reasons, but if the council is saying, okay, we have a three year cost adoption cycle, then having off cycle rule every month, it defeats the purpose of having three years cost adoption cycle. If you want to do it once per year, great. Every six months, great. But every month it confuses stakeholders, it confuses code users, staff, the council staff, the statement we are understaffed is no longer valid because even with 10 people, we can't develop a normal normal schedule. We have the schedule, we have our roles, we have our plans, and we constantly uh, uh, modify uh, our plans. When I get a, a bill for court analysis, for analysis, uh, and the bill needs a fiscal note, one off cycle rule is an average $50,000. Okay, so when, when a sponsor of the bill asks me how much this will cost you, it's about $50,000. And when I get, when I get these several off cycle rules uh, at the State Building Court Council staff, then it, 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 it gets too much work and we can't control that. The other thing is the council needs to decide whether or not we'll continue with the WAC and the insert pages or you want to publish a court because my nobody was listening when I was commenting uh, regarding potential issues with uh, ICC and Wabo publishing the code. This is a great a great thing, you know, to publish Washington courts, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly sending emails or attending meetings. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting involved even, even though I didn't want to, okay? So the council needs to make the decision whether or not we're developing courts, uh, uh, are we developing WAC, you know, some, we need clarity before we start, start the adoption process. Uh, if you surprise the council staff uh, five months before the effective date, then we're, we're doing nobody a favor. And uh, um, the other thing is how we submit the proposals. Uh, we, we receive the proposals, they are with all different formats. Uh, so the council needs to empower the staff a little bit to control that because you know we if we receive proposals in 10 different formats then it leads to uh, mistakes in the course so these are just the things i i want to mention but the, the the 
main goal here is I'm asking a few council members, let's say five or six, the number is not important, uh, to help me with this. I will share my ideas and if we can agree on a, a, a modifications that will help, will streamline the council process, that, that will be great. Okay. So, Damon, go ahead. Stoyan, what uh, what is your timeline for this? Um, this is something I'd be interested in helping in, although obviously I'm going to uh, focus primarily on this task force first and hopefully have that done before summer hits and then jump in. The initial plan was to get it done by March, but I don't think we can make it with, with all cycle goals we are working on. Uh, so let's say uh, before we start with the new adoption process, the 2024, uh, Krista, when we are typically receiving the model for like October, November? Uh, about that, September, October. So let, let's say before, before September, uh, as, as early as possible, but uh, the final day before September. Okay, uh, Micah, go ahead. Uh, of course, I'm interested in, in story probably knew that already. <laughs> Considering I've mentioned this several times, I, I do have, you know, obviously maybe that's a part of the work group, but I think some of the things you want to modify are actually items that are outlined in RCWs as well, which would not be able to be modified um, as easily as bylaws. But um, uh, you know, I have some concerns with process, and, and I've mentioned that over and over. Uh, we do need to define the role of SBCC. Yeah, I think I mentioned that today and what we should be producing or providing. Um, we should, you know, speaking for code officials, I, I, maybe that's a biased opinion, but those are the folks that are tasked with enforcing what you adopt. And if you don't provide them something to enforce, it's it's not going to be as successful as you anticipate. So um, I, I think that's something that we do need to take into consideration with all these things that, that Stoyan mentioned. Um, tag composition uh, and, and everything else, I would just like to be involved. I, hopefully I have enough time to participate. Thanks. Thank you, Chell. Um, yeah, so you're looking for three different work groups, is that? No, I think one work group, uh, it, it, these are all, all related. Uh, uh, I, I, I have it, uh, uh, I prefer one work group, but if the council decides to give three different work groups on that, on that I'm okay with this as well. Uh, okay. I, 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 don't you want to... I don't know what the council decision will be, so this is why you see uh, a singular from two. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then you you said you want the work to be done by September or to start in September? No, to get done by September. When when we start the next code adoption cycle formally, uh, working on 2024 codes, uh, we need the process to be in place because uh, we need to get the schedule done. Uh, we need to uh, know in advance who's doing what. Uh, we don't have problems taking more work. What the problem is not be able to control the schedule. By saying more work, I didn't mean more off cycle rules. What I meant was uh, uh, one example, currently the technical advisory groups are working on the existing uh, amendments, right? So the, uh, the existing amendments report, it takes forever until it's completed. And finally, most likely the the staff is finishing. So if this is the case, then we don't need five technical advisory group meetings to achieve nothing. Staff can do the work uh, uh, and uh, uh, can have the final existing amendments report for the technical advisory group to uh, review and uh, it will be ready for the council to vote up. It will save some time. This one good example. Understood. Micah, go ahead. Uh, a, a few points to additionally make. I, I 
I don't see this work being done by September. And I don't believe we should only limit this to SBCC council members. Um, I think your 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 a broad scope of changes could occur here, and I don't think you would have enough time to develop those and get public input on that adequately. So I think that maybe we should expand the scope of your work group to include some members of the public. Um, I do have some concerns on trying to modify our code adoption process, considering. Uh, I'm not sure we've taken into account that right now we align with the ICC process and that has been modified for next code cycle as well. Um, and so that would have to take into account. I just, I honestly think in my opinion, based on what you're trying to accomplish that you need to expand your work group to at least members of the public to some way, shape or form or, or just beyond council members and uh, the timing expectation uh, i think is ambitious to say the least i i want to start with council members only with only one reason not to keep secrets from the public but if we start with nothing and involve the public it will take forever to you know to end up with the language i want to have a base language that we can work on uh, but with that, that can, I, can I follow up? Yes. Well, so with I, that, have we, do you have something that has identified all the issues that you're concerned with and have, and where do those come from? Has it only been from the council? Has that been from members of the public? I mean, you're asking the work group to do something when uh, I'm not sure that the issues or items in all these areas have been identified. Well, if it makes sense to you, we receive emails and comments and phone calls every day with issues related to the State Building Code Council policies and procedures. So I I don't think all these ideas that I have, they're my ideas. It's based on the comments we have been receiving in, in the last, not two years, but many years. Uh, and it's based on our experience uh, during the current code adoption cycle that we just completed. So again, I don't want to keep it secret, but I want to start with something with smaller group to uh, start the discussion and then we can we can expand. Uh, Roger, go ahead. So my understanding, Stoyan, is you want one working group to sit down and look at the composition of the tags and how the members are appointed, look at the bylaws, and come to the council for with some suggestions, recommendations on making some modifications. Um, I think, Micah, your concern about bringing the public in that would that's when the public would be able to take a look at su suggestions and make um, and comment on suggested changes to those. So, I think a starting point of a group to just um, understand what the challenges have been, what the complaints have, have um, that Stoyan's heard, come up with, um, here's some suggestions that we have to address those. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm happy to be on this group, Stoyan, so. Okay, Micah, go ahead. Great points, Roger. Uh, the question would be then, Stoyan, your, your indication of September, would that be to get some ideas out there that, to share with the public by then? Or you're talking about the whole entire process from start to finish, done, reviewed, voted on, and in place by the end of September 2023? I'm talking about the entire process. And, and the only reason I have September is because uh, when we start with 2024 court adoption cycle, we, we need all those in place. Uh, if we can't, it's not a hard stop. We can keep doing it, but at least we need to be close to what the council needs to do. So September is not, a, again, it's not a hard stop. It could be October, uh, but when we get the model codes, then it, it, it will and start working in 2024. It will be too late. Uh, for example, I need to prepare the schedule for 2024 code adoption cycle by uh, Krista. Was it uh, uh, August or I think August, August of 2023? 
and then I we can update it, right? But I can't prepare a schedule without knowing what the council what wants to do with the call. The, the schedule is related to the council uh, process. Yeah. So this is why I said September. Can we do it later? Yeah, we can. Okay. Roger, anything further on that? Okay. Uh, Damon, go ahead. I just wanted to note that uh, in regards to the timeline, obviously there is legislation that uh, touches on some of these subjects, such as tag member qualifications and uh, and bylaw stuff. So it may be prudent to wait and see what happens with that legislation before anything is finalized. That's my only observation. Thanks. Thank you, Damon. Micah, go ahead. Sorry, I had to come back around again, but I. I... Uh, again, I think you should look to expand, and maybe it's just expand to a former SBCC member from, say, two or three code cycles ago. Um, I, I am aware that the process was changed in the recent past. I want to say it was either two code cycles ago to where it split to the group one, group two. And, and you know, are we going to go backwards to something that wasn't functioning before because we don't have that historical knowledge? Um, so, so, again, I, I, I really would like to stress that maybe we should expand your work group a little bit and maybe that's just to a former SBCC member that was around during that process when they switched to this new format um, to make sure we don't go backwards to something that didn't work before. That, uh, again, I, I just want to make sure we're capturing what we need to. I, I, I have Krista here. Do you think she's less knowledgeable than, than former council members? I don't know. I'm not saying that Chris is less knowledgeable than former council members, but Chris is on the inside of the process, not on the outside of the process. So, so yeah, there is some difference there. This is why I, and, wanted, and, this is why I wanted this whole discussion. I'll go with whatever the council decides. My personal opinion is we need to start with a small group and current council members to get something. And then we can expand with former council members and members of the public follow the process. Does anyone have a motion? Shell, go ahead. Well, I guess has anybody volunteered? Who's volunteered for these groups? Because I think the groups are a good idea. And I would make a motion to start the groups, but the groups would have to have somebody on them. And I haven't heard that many people volunteering to be on the groups. Let's start with this. So, Ann, do you have an Excel sheet that you can pull up with a work group that we can type names into for those that volunteer? I can do that. Okay. And then at that point, we can make a motion to officially establish the work group depending on how the council sees fit. Okay. Okay, so who, who would like to be on this work group? Just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, we have Micah, Roger, Damon, Katie. Chell. Anybody. I'll, I'll volunteer to be on the group, but my participation during the summer is going to be limited. Uh, Damon. Okay. Be done before summer, Cal. <laughs> I, I like my summer. <laughs> Especially Fridays at 3.40. Okay, are there any other members of council that would like to be a part of the work group? Uh, 
Uh, Chair, this is Todd. I, I'll volunteer if you need more members. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm concerned a little bit about um, just attendance issues through the summer and availability of council members. And so I think the more, the better. Uh, for that reason, go ahead and put my, my name down as well. However, I'm just going to warn that, you know, my attendance will probably not be as much as I would like it to be for a work group like this. So, okay. If we, uh, if we put Matthew Hepner down, does that count as three more people? Exactly. Yeah. We just went to 12. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is the work group so far at this point. What I'm, what I'm seeing is that we have a, a work group that's volunteered to work on these things and we have a timeline. Uh, the, the only thing that really comes into question at this point is whether the, the motion would include members of the public or something more than what we have here. Cheryl, go ahead. Make a motion that we establish a work group to work on the three bullet points that were in the agenda that Stoyan outlined and that includes these and is open to the public as I believe all, all of our meetings are. Um, and that we then bring this back to the council in even more public meetings to discuss. Ms. Corey, I second. Just one point of clarification, Chell. Do you wanna add a time frame for first meeting since we got to get rolling. I guess there's no chair of the group other than perhaps Stoyan. So maybe Stoyan sets the time for the meetings. I want to start, uh, let's say March 1st. I guess the hope is that we finish up before the next code cycle, but I don't know that I, I need, that needs to be part of the motion. If do we need a motion to specify a time? I, I don't know what is coming from the from the session. This is why I'm a little bit concerned about specifying a time. I if there is a time, I'll try to meet it, but if it's Understood. R Roger. Can we just add to the motion with the intent to um, have re resolution or a work product by September prior to the next code cycle? It's an intent, not hard. I'll modify the motion to say uh, with the intent to um, complete work by the end of September this year. This is Corey and my second still stands. Okay. So the motion is to establish the work group that we see in front of us to complete the three bullet points that are on today's agenda. Uh, and the intent is to complete by September. And the work group will bring back what they come up with to council. And from there, it can go through the process. Shell? Okay. All right. Discussion. Perfect. Let's do uh, a roll call. Chell Anderson. Yay. Jay Arnold. Uh, Jay had to leave. Todd Bayreuther. Aye. Micah Chappelle. Yes. Damon Doyle. Yes. Roger Haringa. Yes. yes. Matthew Hepner.
Frank Holt? Yes. Peter Ricky? Aye. Katie Sheehan? Yes. Corey Wilker? Yes. And one more for Matthew Hefner. Um, the ayes have it. Okay, motion carries. Okay, with that, we'll move to um, other business. Does anyone have other business? Uh, Micah, go ahead. I don't know if this falls under the business, but uh, just for clarification, did we actually give the legislative committee any additional authority or did we just vote for the general authority to the SBCC director? It, it seems like we only voted on the individual bills and, and didn't, and then we moved to break and didn't have any further discussion. I think the vote was the vote was for the managing director on. For the triumvirate, uh, Stoyan, Todd, and Tony. Yeah. We need to check that. Uh, Chair, this is Todd. Um, Go ahead. My characterization of it is there's a blanket wide for the managing director, and then on two of the, the bills, there was authority for the chair of the council, the chair of the committee, and, and Stoyan to inform. Is that sound correct to everyone? I, I think so, yes. And then one op, op, and an, and then a, op, opposition to the last bill. Yes. Micah, anything further on that? Yeah, I think that almost defeats the, person, the, the purpose of having a legislative committee, uh, unless it's to give story and direction to give general information. Uh, I think it, it limits, you know, the input that the legislative committee can have on bills during session since we don't meet again until March. Um, and if, if others are of that opinion, I would like to look at maybe reconsidering that vote to where we could or or not just that vote but reconsider that item on the agenda i always consult with the ledge committee uh, i don't go on my own uh, if there is a need for something uh, if a sponsor is asking uh, and uh, we don't, you know what? I, don't I, I know we're short on time starting i I'm sorry to interrupt but i'll say but i'll say but I understand that you do go to the legislative committee, but the council didn't give any authority to the legislative committee based on the vote. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. They didn't give any authority to the legislative committee to give you additional direction or or authority to do something beyond information only without position. That's that's what I'm getting at. Okay. Mike, if you have a motion, let's go ahead and do it. And if, if it is supported through a second, then that's what will happen. Sorry, you're on mute. Like I said. I'm mute. Um, I want to move to reconsider uh, allowances under what was that item? Oh, hell, I don't have the agenda up. I got you. Sorry, coming back to it. Under um, item nine of the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a second. Discussion. Micah, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, the reason, again, I wanted to reconsider this is because I do think we should allow the legislative committee some, some authority to provide guidance on these bills since we're not meeting more regularly as a full council. Um, and if I need to make a motion, I'll do that after some additional discussion. Okay, Shell, go ahead. Please keep in yeah. mind that we are up against the clock. I, I cannot stay past four, so that leaves us 10 minutes, so brevity would be appreciated. Yep, so my, the intent of my motion, my understanding of the motion that I made to empower the uh, the managing director 
was to take technical consideration from the legislative committee and pass it on to um, legislators and those writing bills and, and helping with bills um, and do pretty much everything but take an opinion on whether pro or against, and basically remain neutral unless the, the full council votes on it. Um, that was the intent. And if that's not clear, then um, maybe, we should re maybe we should reconsider, uh, but, but I thought it was clear. Thank you, Damon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's a motion and a second on the floor to reconsider a previously approved motion. Uh, since minutes are taken for this meeting, can the secretary please read the motion as voted? We don't have this, op this option. We, after we are done with the meeting, we uh, develop the meetings listening to the recordings. Okay, so we have this is this is why I was frustrated earlier. We are put, putting out motions with a lot of adjectives and added on phrases, and we don't know what the original motion was. And here we're voting to reconsider a motion that nobody can describe verbatim. So I would say that I, the floor is out of order. I wouldn't say I could describe it out of verbatim, but Chael gave the description of his intent was to allow Stoyan, Todd. And Tony, authority to provide information only without permission or without uh, position on legislative titles. My motion to reconsider would be so that we can allow the legislative committee to have some type of authority outside of those three individuals. Shell's uh, intent and the motion that we voted on are two separate things. So, point of order. We have to, if we're going to vote to reconsider, it has to be on the motion as written. Yeah, I don't know if this is helpful at all. I obviously have no, no stake in the outcome of this. Uh, it seems to me that maybe a motion for reconsider isn't the right way of framing this up. Sorry, I didn't say anything earlier. If Micah's intent here is to actually empower the uh, legislative committee to do something in addition to what uh, Chell's previous motion had, has established. So I, I'm not throwing that out to, um, to tangle things up any bit more, but it, it might be helpful if, if we, instead of reconsidering the previous motion, we have a, a, a vote on a new proposal or an additional proposal. Agreed, Derek. Okay. Let's, let's, what we need at this point is what is another motion for what you're asking for. Sure. I, okay, I will, I will send that motion. I move to allow the legislative committee leeway in decision-making on legislative items that affect the SBCC to the extent that um, if something needs to be brought to the full council, then we have to have a, a special meeting. I, I, I don't know how to word that to give them authority because I don't know what limits we want to have on their authority, but that's going to be my basic motion. Do we have a second? I'm not clear on the motion. Um, okay. Uh, can... The motion is to allow legislative committee to have authority to take action on legislation without full council approval, considering the legislative committee is made up of council members. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion, Damon, go ahead. Can you please elaborate on what take action means? Sure. Um, I guess that would be to provide additional or modified language to the legislation that meets the, you know, uh, in intent of the SBCC legislative committee, I, I, that would be taking an action. Uh, other things similar to that. Does that work, Damon? I, I'm sorry, Mike, it doesn't. Um, it's, it's too broad. I'll have to vote in, against the motion. 
Corey, go ahead. I don't think we should be giving any authority to allow people to talk about things outside of full council vote. I'll be opposed as well. Okay, uh, Chell, please. If the motion is simple, is as simple as giving the legislative committee the authority to oppose or support legislation, I think that would be a motion. I wouldn't support the motion, but that is how I kind of understand the motion. But I haven't heard it stated that clearly. Thank you, Katie. Go ahead. Um, I would be interested to know if Todd or who's the chair of the committee or Tony, if you feel like that's necessary to conduct the business of the legislative committee. Chair, this is Todd. Go ahead, Todd. Um, yeah, so th this is always the challenge of the legislative committee. I I've served on it for maybe three years now. Um, there is no authority, right? Um, and so I, I think that there, there, instead of two extremes, there is an in-between where it could be the, give the legislative committee authority to inform um, the legislation, right? Uh, because right now we're at zero uh, authority and I, and I hear the concerns for the broad, you know, authority. So I've always interpreted that line that it would be valuable to conduct our business to be able to inform as if we were, you know, a state agency, for example. And that and that doesn't imply that we are taking a a hard position for the for the council without so, full council vote. And so currently you don't have that authority under the current motions that we have. That's how I understand it. You, you and, and thanks, Todd. You, you said that better than I did. It was my intent is not to give authority to oppose or support explicitly, but the, the committee does not have authority to provide the valued information that could be an action, but it's not an oppose or support action. And again, as a state employee, when I worked for Washington State University, that term was to inform. Okay. You see in the screen the current authority for the uh, ledge committee, which is basically nothing, but this is how the bylaw. Understood. Uh, Michael, do you have anything further? Uh, no, I, I think the reason I wanted to make this motion is based on the information that Stoyan is showing on, you know, it talks about items four and five. The legislative committee only has the authority to recommend to the council or inform the council. And again, we're not meeting again until the session's almost over. So that my intent was to provide the, the committee the authority to provide some information instead of, you know, um, not have that, you know, not have that able to take any action. Again, I'm not looking for them to oppose or support. And that's why I didn't include that in my motion. Understood. Uh, I need to make a motion. Sorry, I need to make a motion to extend the meeting. I apologize, but we'll extend it 15 minutes. I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Uh, I don't believe the chair can make a motion, but I'd be happy to make that motion in your Thanks, stead. Thanks, I appreciate it. I believe the chair can make a motion. We have a motion and a second. If anyone does have discussion, I'd like the remaining hands from the previous motion to remain up. So just speak up if you have discussion now on extending to 15 minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, Micah, I'm sorry to cut you off. Continue. No, I was done. I, I, I didn't want this to go this long. I thought this would be a simple item and it's turned into a fiasco. And that was not my intent at all. I just wanted the legislative committee to have some authority because we're not meeting again at all and and it's in limbo at this point in my opinion thanks understood thank you Micah. pete go ahead yeah i think we we want to make a motion that gives the legislative committee and stoyan 
the power to discuss the capabilities and scope of the SBCC and inform legislatures on what we can and cannot do legally and not make an opinion on any specific bill, but tell them whether or not their particular law or, or bill is possible within the scope of, of our organization. And I think that's the intent. Uh, I'm not sure I can figure out how to say that in a motion, but I think Understood. that's what we're trying to shoot for. Yeah, we have a motion on the table that, that is, I think, there. So thank you so much. Uh, Damon, do you have anything further? No, I do not. I'm sorry. I oh, my head. That's OK. And uh, Todd, I believe that's your hand. Do you have anything further? Oh, sorry. No, nope, that's OK. Well, go ahead. Okay, so as I understand it, the motion is simply the, the previous motion that we already voted on gave Stoyan and the legislative uh, via the legislative committee the ability to talk to the, all these legislators that were so I, I don't understand how the motion now is different than the one before. They just extended it. But to the extent that that this one doesn't yeah. doesn't yeah. allow the legislative committee to oppose or support legislation. I don't I don't I'm I'm okay with this motion. You call the question. For all I can tell is that instead of me, Todd, and Stoyan having the ability. The committee as a whole has the ability. Am I mistaken there? Nope, that was where I was. But my understanding was you, Todd, and Stoyan are limited to three bills outside of or two bills, and Stoyan is unlimited to all the bills. That's my understanding of the previous motion as well. I think Todd mentioned that earlier. That's why I was trying to expand that to the legislative committee that's made up of the council members. Again, let's call the question. It's way past time. I didn't want to go down this route. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do I need a second on call the question? Second. Thank you. My brain is zapped. Uh, all uh, discussion. Point of order. Go ahead. Uh, if there's no objection to calling the question, you don't need to vote on it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Let's go ahead and do a roll call. Michelle Anderson? Aye. Jay Arnold? No, nope, nope, he's gone early. Todd Mayruther? Aye. Michael Chappelle? Aye. Damon Doyle? Aye. Roger Haringa? Aye. Matthew Hepner? Craig Holt? Aye. Peter Rickey? Aye. Katie Sheehan? Aye. Corey Wilker? Aye. The ayes have it. Motion carries. Anything further on other business? Okay. Um, one sec. Let me double check the. Okay. Um, with that, we'll go to staff report. We, it doesn't seem we have time for that, so I'll keep it for the next time. Thank you. Uh, with that, motion to adjourn. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Appreciate nice it. Nice work, Tony. Thanks for staying the extra minutes. Yep. See you. Good to see all of you. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Happy New Year, everybody. Take care. Uh, Stoyan? Yes, sir. If Derek has time, will you send me a, a Zoom real quick? Yes. Thank you.